It was said that the artistic filmmaker Lucchino Visconti made sure that when actors pointed at a closed box meant to contain jewels, there were real jewels inside. It could be an effective way to make actors live their part. I think that Visconti's gesture may also come out of a plain sense of aesthetics and a desire for authenticity. Somehow it may not feel right to fool the viewer. And talking of authenticity, which you've just quoted from Taleb's Black Swan, if one goes to rationalvc.com, they'll see the three long-standing core values of the brand, which are authenticity, truth-seeking, long-termism. One could just simply subscribe to get a summary of all the hard work we put into these videos, into these podcasts. After every episode, you get a summarized email of the learnings from each episode, exclusive content and early releases to podcasts. And every episode, we read a Lindy book and explore Lindy ideas and how one can apply them to business and life. So that's rationalvc.com. And yeah, Black Swan. What do you make of this book? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you've watched our previous video on Taleb's first book in the Inserto series, which is called Fooled by Randomness, click here if you're watching on YouTube to, to view that episode and, and please do listen on Spotify. We think it's actually good if you listen to that episode first to get an understanding of where Taleb starts his journey so that when you get into this book, you're able to basically better understand exactly where he's coming from. Although I would say a lot of those same concepts are repeated in this yes, book. Yes. Isn't it, didn't you say to me, uh, or I read somewhere maybe, when he was writing Fooled by Randomness, he stopped at some point halfway through or something, came and wrote Black Swan, and then went back to Fooled by Randomness. He, he says it in Fooled by Randomness, they, yeah, where he it. says, uh, the ability to think uh, not in a linear fashion, and we'll get in, this is one of the key points that he brings out in, in this book, among other cognitive biases. He talks about uh, the ability to move uh, sort of a, aside from the lateral perspective or the linear perspective and, and basically go and do things where he feels mm -hmm. like his intellect is being challenged. Mm -hmm. So because he felt an intellectual curiosity to what a black swan was, he actually left full, full by randomness, went into the black swan. Work. And you see a lot of overlapping ideas in the two books. Yeah. Actually, funnily enough, uh, you see a lot of overlapping ideas with this book as you do with Fooled by Randomness, with uh, the work of Kahneman and Tversky, particularly in their book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Wasn't in Fooled by Randomness, Tyler was referring to Kahneman as Daniel Kahneman. In this book, it's literally like they're mates and buddies. And I was like, Danny Kahneman. <laughs> and it's funny because if you follow Taleb on Twitter, which you should because he holds himself to account and therefore calls out a lot of BS he sees yeah. publicly, he's had a falling out, I think, with Kahneman as really? well. I think so, yeah. Um, but anyway, to answer your initial question, what did I think of the book? The book is complicated. You should under have an understanding of the core concepts of Taleb, some maybe basic understanding of statistics and also the Kahneman and Tversky work yep. before diving into this book. But equally, as a standalone book, it's literally a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece because he brings to light concepts that are of fundamental importance for people that work in industries where risk is very important, namely financial markets, yep. which is what his own background is. What we're gonna do in this episode, I suppose, is follow a little bit of a structure of what we think the core learnings, the Lindy learnings are that we've taken away from this book. Yeah. And then, towards the latter end for the autistic nerds that really want to get into the detail, much like us, we're going to go chapter by chapter yeah. and discuss specifically what he talks about in each of those chapters. Yeah, for the autistic people, the robots who need some structure, uh, they can wait for that later in the episode. But initially, structure will follow it pretty much how you said that. That's how the episode is going to go. What I will say just as I said, a preface, just like the prior episode with all the Inserto episodes. These books from the Inserto series, Taleb's books, these are not books to be read. They are books to be studied. As some people may know, if you don't now, you will know. But as of episode 50... Get to know. Get to know. If you don't know, get to know. As of episode 50, we pivoted the show. We stopped interviewing kind of Silicon Valley big shots or whatever. And we thought 
those episodes, no one's going to go back to listen to interviews really many years from now. But if you do a Lindy episode, ideally hundreds or thousands of years from now, imagine that could be listened to, which it, 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 the ideas should stay. Mm. That's awesome. And so uh, we pivoted. And as of episode 50, which was the last episode, uh, we're doing Lindy books every episode. Uh, but the first five or six episodes will be the Inserto series plus Poor Charlie's Almanac, the books that have shaped our brand. The founding of our brand is based on originally four years ago and the philosophies. These are the five or six books which every 50, 100 episodes or whatever we'll keep coming back to because they're books to be reread. Taleb talks himself about rereading books and the importance of, I mean, even Naval says like rather than reading a thousand it's, it's become a fucking flex of here's a photo of a thousand books I've read it's better to actually have an anti-library and then also reread profound books Lindy books which uh, the ideas will uh, evergreen essentially so that's the preface these these are tough books to crack one episode is not going to do any justice we'll keep coming back to them every year or couple of years with improved understanding as you go through more experiences in life with age, experience, maturity, and rereading, you gain new perspectives. And we hope that with every every uh, redo of the episode, it gets better and better. But here we are with our current understanding, and we know that some of you like to understand where we are in life and share our learning. So all of that out of the way, let's get on with the episode. La one last thing. This is not a... If you give us almost any other book, let's say Poor Charlie's Almanac, Robert Cialdini's Influence, Whatever, you give us any book on this bookshelf here, it's pretty, fairly easy to go through. It's structured well, but these books, which actually goes to show, Taleb said himself something along the lines of, he despises journalists. The chapter names, the chapter titles, and the contents page will not really give away what this book is about. Journalists, what they would historically do is, they just look at the back of the book, they look at the contents of the book, and then that's it. They'll, they'll write some BS review of, without reading it. And so Taleb's aim was he wanted to write these books in a way whereby journalists could not tell what that chapter or whatever is going to be about. He couldn't summarize it, which I love. And also when books are so uh, not complicated, but deep, not shallow, not your prescriptive top sellers BS list. It's not easy to go through like other books, basically, is what I'm getting at. It's all it's kind of all over the place on your first read. And Taleb's authenticity comes through because he's just writing as he wishes. I think I've read this book four to five times. Uh, every single time you take something differently away from the book. Um, and it's actually good to step away from the book, experience shit, and then come back and read the book because your new experiences then inform some of the concepts yeah. or give you real life examples that you've experienced around those specific concepts to, to your point around, <laughs> to your point around, uh, Taleb putting the book in that, in that kind of manner. I, th I think Taleb's personality is such that he is, he, he doesn't dislike conflict, but he is able to deal well with conflict and therefore he likes creating an environment that is somewhat conflicting yeah. so that, so that he's not like becoming aligned to the norm and you get this sense with this book and what i mean by that is like your example is he's written the book in a way which is like you can't just skim through it you've got to study it but equally he has this ability in the book to just randomly call different people and things out and do it in a way in like a dry humor way in his first book in full by randomness you you get this uh, like you get this view that he's doing it a little bit against the grain i.e he's like trying to get this side of his personality out but he's not like fully going gung-ho with it yeah. with this you see the progression of his writing style insofar as it's just as complicated it's just as like splattered on a page kind of vibe mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's a little bit less worried about what readers are going to think of how he's written this because he's so confident in what it is that he's writing. Yeah. Um, so he's not aligning himself to the average reader. He's trying to be very specific around the type of reader who reads this. Okay. So in terms of structure of how we're going to do this, I mentioned at the beginning that we'll do a deep dive into each chapter towards the end of the podcast. What we're going to structure this as is a breakdown across three to four different areas, right? The first thing we probably need to talk about, which is the title of the book, is what is a black swan? Mm -hmm. So let's deep dive a little bit into terminology. The second thing we'll talk about 
is why humans are susceptible to black swans, mm -hmm. which this is the bit which kind of, you know, where we talked about it aligning a bit to the cognitive biases and the, the work that Kahneman and Tversky have done. The third bit we'll probably talk about is on the types of worlds that exist. Mm -hmm. So that's mediocristan versus extremistan. The fourth thing we'll talk about is why midwit memes are bullshit. <laughs> the Gaussian curve being an intellectual fraud. Basically why the bell curve doesn't work. And then the fifth thing we'll talk about is investing. So how does this all apply to the world of investing, which is really where value can be derived from, from his work. On that note, let's start with terminology. What, what is a black swan in your view? We have here, Taleb himself says, I stop and summarize the triplets, rarity, extreme impact, and retrospective, though not prospective predictability. And he has an, he has an asterisk here, the footnotes, the highly expected not happening is also a black swan. Note that by symmetry, the occurrence of a highly improbable event is the equivalent of the non-occurrence of a highly probable one. I mean, there are some examples here, but he talks about just imagine how little your understanding of the world on the eve of the events of 1914 would have helped you guess what was to happen next. Don't cheat by using the explanations drilled into your cranium by your dull high, high school teacher. So yeah, I'll stop there because I don't want to just quote from the book, but that's that's uh, his definition. Yes. So it's quite interesting. So the first thing is he, he brings up a number of examples over and over again around what a black swan is, the eve of World War One being, you know, the cause or the eve of World War One being one of them. And in fact, in one of the footnotes in the book, he talks about historian Neil Ferguson, who Neil Ferguson is now blown up a professor at Stanford, I suppose, and, and, and a bunch of other positions, I think, previously at Oxford. But he calls him out because he was one of the only historians that came about to say specifically that the reasons you've been given as to why World War I occurred, I don't know, like the killing of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavrilo Princip and all of that stuff, is actually not like the genuine causes or like it wasn't economics. Anyway, he talks about Neil Ferguson very early on. I like that. But to summarize what he said, I think in a simple sentence, Black swans are unpredictable rare events that are outliers, have an extreme impact and are explainable ex post. And what I mean by that latter part is that after the fact, and we'll get into this when we talk about some of the cognitive biases humans have, we like to explain the reasoning behind it. When in yes. fact, we couldn't, you couldn't predict it in the first place. So how are you going to explain it post? Hindsight bias. Correct. That's what we picked up on in, uh, in FBR. Four four randomness. Randomness. Yeah. The one example that Which, I think... I'm sorry before we, which is basically, this is a psychology work in many, many aspects. It is a psychological work. I mean, the, the whole point of Kahneman and Tversky's work was meant to push the boundaries of that specific space forward, which is why yes. I think he uses a lot of them, their findings. And other quick examples, like I mentioned the eve of 1914, World War One, but he talks about how about the market crash of 1987, which I think Taleb made a huge amount of money in. Is that Black Monday? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, he made a lot of money in. Um, he talks about how about the uh, you know the spread of the internet so that that was unexpected so but the, there's one so if you type into google or, the, or these days in chat gpt <laughs> uh explain to me an example of um a black swan typically the example that everybody uses is the one that he comes up with which is the turkey at thanksgiving turkey. Let's, let's go to that one tell us what the Turkey at Thanksgiving. It's pretty funny. So this is this this also talks to his ability, like Talib's ability to come up with these random, like funny examples. And he just uses so many bloody examples in this book that it fries your brain. This is a before you, the, the, okay, now you're getting excited. This is an example of you and I both consume a shit ton of whether it's books, online content, blogs, tweets, just endless consumption of content material, knowledge, whatever you want to call it. And I went on a podcast recently. I was interviewed by Ollie Fox on the Brick by Brick podcast. Brilliant pod. We'll tag it in the show notes and uh, you can click here. We'll to, tag it if you want to hear me ramble on for two, two plus hours. And you're probably going to hear that on this episode as well. <laughs> at some point, Ollie said, which someone else on a prior, a prior another podcast had said to me, they all say the same thing. They're like, 
wow, Cyrus, you're, you're like an in, in, encyclopedia so much. And I'm like, I'm just a pleb who, who just memorized a whole bunch of shit. And my dream, wait, 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 wait. And my dream is to leave the world as a true erudite. We, we, we have a joke. Just, just <laughs> we, have a, we have a running joke between our different friend circles where we're like, whenever Cyrus wants to give you an answer to any question you pose to him. He pulls it out from the encyclopedia. He will literally just say, according to this person or according <laughs> to that person, according to Naval, I'll take a shot. So yeah, it, it's very hard to find what Cyrus thinks about a specific situation because he's like entering this encyclopedic knowledge of what other people think about this, yes, the situation. But the point I was trying to get at before, we do a lot of sidetracks by the way, like any episode. Uh, the point I was trying to get at is- He's forgotten the point. <laughs> Talib himself. So I, I said to the guys on these podcasts, I'm like, I'm just a player trying to figure it out. My dream is to leave the world as a true erudite. And when you read, I mean, Naval Shaw, he's like this. He, he's been reading since his mum told him to go to the library after school since he was a kid in New York. But Taleb, having grown up in a house with a library, you can see that all of the knowledge he's been accumulating his entire life since childhood into adulthood, he basically just vomits so much. There is no noise. It's just signal in this book, basically. If you want to get nerdy autistic terms of like the yeah. signal noise, think boy ratio, whatever, there's endless signal in this book. Mm. And... So when people say to me, like, you're like an encyclopedia, I'm like, no, this is like an encyclopedia. This guy is just fucking quoting endlessly. And all of the ideas, are uh, sure, some of them are from, as he talks about, not theory, but rather practice, his own experiences in the real world, in the trading floor, whatever. But a lot of it is he name drops so many of history's greatest thinkers. Hmm. And the reason and we say, OK, the rational VC pod hopefully will go on for until we're alive. And every episode we explore a Lindy book. We don't even know, like, okay, we can pull out 30, 40 or 50 Lindy books. Where do you go after that? The reason Taleb and Munger have shaped our brand is because you just crack open poor Charlie's Almanac or you just crack open any of Taleb's books. They name drop so many of history's greatest thinkers that it's a starting point of those are then the Lindy books we need to explore next in future episodes. So exactly to your point, he just brain dumps so many deep thought-provoking ideas from history from his learnings mm. that it just goes to show how i mean to say he's well read is an understatement he is well read but he's not just like reading books and stuff it's like he brings experiences of his life to the fore as well yes um but look getting back to the point around turkey so if you are a turkey and you're raised in a farm every single experience you will have had to date whatever that date is before your thousandth day yep. will be positive you have humans that are feeding you. Uh, you're right there. <laughs> Only you would get sound Pellegrino water and then fill it with electrolytes. Yes. Anyway, if you are a turkey. Turkey on a farm. On a farm, humans will be the best thing in the world for you because up until your thousandth day, you're being fed, you're being given female turkeys to mate with, you're being sh put in a beautiful shelter, and you're also being like um, put in a safe space so that cats and foxes can't get you. So you think these humans are incredible creatures. Up until the point that it hits the thousandth day, and it's a week before Thanksgiving, and they chop your head off. To the turkey, that event is a black swan because you are a sucker. Yes. You did not have any information to suggest otherwise so and to the farmer it's not a black swan to the farmer is not a black swan so therefore the farmer is not a sucker this is the whole point around asymmetric information that he kind of picks up throughout this book and mm -hmm. we'll get into a bit more detail around that but the point is that a black swan to the turkey is its <laughs> is its death yeah now if the turkey were to survive after having its head chopped off it may come up with mm -hmm. as humans do ex post reasoning as to why that happened oh the farmer was had problems with their marriage and therefore decided that they had to kill me or whatever the hell the reason they come up with endlessly with people who say oh this founder in silicon valley who you know they've ipo'd oh, they've hit this you know zero to a 500 million arr whatever bullshit and they <laughs> ipo'd whatever it's because of these reasons wow and now they get on stage we should listen to them this is i mean so many of so much of what we discuss in fall by randomness is being repeated here yes but in a slightly different way of with, with the ideas of now presented with black swan so as you say you look back and obviously hindsight bias is a point we've we've discussed to say 
you try to pinpoint specific reasons or explanations for why such events have taken place or why this person or this company has been successful, which is the complete wrong way to look at it. It's complete blindness. Brings us nicely onto the second point of, you know, our key learnings from this is what are the different human blindnesses that make us unable to predict or see black swans? And I think the first thing, obviously he picks up a lot of Kahneman and Tversky's work, Danny Kahneman and Tversky's work, work <laughs> in this book. But the first thing he talks about, so, so let me just quickly run through some of the, some of these Please. names and then we can come and talk about them in more detail. So the first is confirmation error. The second is a round trip fallacy. The third is a narrative fallacy. The fourth is ludic fallacy. He also touches on something called platonicity, which is quite interesting. It's mm -hmm. about Plato. Um, the distortion of silent evidence and tunneling, and then he, yeah. the value of having an anti-library, which you've touched on. So if, if we go back to the first one, which is confirmation error, um, do, do you want to go on what, what you think confirmation error is and what he talks about? Or do you want me to give a short overview? Or? Give a short, because I was going to touch on a different point with respect to blindness. Okay. Um, with confirmation error, it's basically exactly what you talked about around hindsight bias, just looking at it the other way around, which mm -hmm. is using the past to predict what the future would look like, given that the future is unseen. So using scenes to determine unseens. Yep. Right? It's a very human thing to do. Um, and it's always looking for uh, correlations instead of identifying causations. Mm -hmm. So for example, the common one I hear a lot uh, is, if you're a billionaire, you've dropped out of college. Therefore, if I drop out of college, I'm likely to become a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Now that's not, obviously that doesn't work. There's, there's no logic to that. But what you'll hear is like someone wanting to drop out of college and telling their parents, well, look, Bill Gates and I don't know who else dropped out of college and look how well, you know, they're doing. Or cri like, crypto. Uh, don't give me started. <laughs> um, but that's the confirmation error is like humans are always looking for correlation instead of causation. Yes. And... Just to rewind a little bit, because we're touching on the blindness point, Talib himself says the central idea of this book concerns our blindness with respect to randomness, particularly the large deviations. Why do we, scientists or non-scientists, hotshots or regular Joes, tend to see the pennies instead of the dollars? Why do we keep focusing on the minutia, not the possible significant large events, in spite of the obvious evidence of their huge influence? And if you follow my argument, why does reading the newspaper actually decrease your knowledge of the world? Which comes back so much to why we do what we do with Lindy books and podcasts and not kind of interviews or what's the latest tech this, tech that. Because if you have foundational understanding of Lindy ideas within all the major disciplines, the big ideas as Peter Kaufman and Charlie Munger say and how you can apply them, that'll benefit you far more in business, in life, in VC, in startups, tech, whatever way more than what he talks about here, whether it's newspapers or the latest trends or your tech crunch or your Twitter, which we fall prey to Twitter, but you know, uh, Twitter, different story has its pros and cons, but generally speaking with, with publications and media uh, and their downsides. And as an extension to that, he talks about black swans, of course, being unpredictable, but later on in the book, he also gets, and a lot of this book is jumping around, right? Mm. So black swans, negative black swans and positive black swans. And you obviously want to decrease as much as possible your exposure to negative black swans, but increase your exposure to positive black swans. So an example of a positive black swan is, says himself here, venture capital, and you want to maximize your exposure to it, uh, which have, unfortunately now too many people have uh, in the last few years max tried to maximize their exposure to it. But really, how do I even say it's smokes and mirrors, it's, it's BS. We'll come to this later on when we talk about some of the prescriptions that exist within the financial space um, around what you should do in terms of financial investing when it comes to black swans. But this is a great point. So all we spoke about when we gave the, uh, the, the terminology, the definition of what black swan was, was the negative angle. We didn't talk about the positive angle, which is like you want to increase your upside, but maximizing your exposure to black swans also increases risk. So he talks mm -hmm. about insuring, insuring against the downside negative aspects um, of a black swan or just general downside negative 
cumulative effects that would lead up to so let's jump to that because you mentioned as i said this book is you we can't necessarily go in order Mm. his thoughts are not in order he's jumping around himself so you just mentioned gain exposure to a positive black swan but then you want to manage your risk with respect to that exposure so one idea that comes to mind which he talks about in one of the later chapters we'll link right right here to this idea of yours is the barbell strategy which I wrote about in my OG angel investing essay, which is how we like to typically approach things with our investing at rational.fund. But how, give us a quick overview of the barbell strategy and how it links to managing your risk, but yet still gaining exposure to positive black swans without the risk of destruction, which Talib says you should always avoid, obviously, the risk of being wiped out or destruction. So, uh, just to touch on that last bit that you said, the risk of being wiped out. The reason he brings this up a lot is because he had a background in trading Mm -hmm. and the worst traders were the ones that would make a shit ton of money appear super hot and be the coolest, newest traders figuring out a new way to make shit tons of money actually ended up like completely blowing up. Go and listen to our episode on Fool by Randomness. We we really deep dive into that specific thing. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do is not blow up, i.e. die or lose all your money or whatever. Um, the barbell strategy in simple terms is that you put 85 to 90% of your investments, money making capability, whatever it is, right? 90% goes into safe options. And those can be things like T bills, like treasury bills, for example. What you're saying essentially there is I want to take as minimal risk, but see a little bit of return because I know that in a worst case scenario, if your T-bills go to shit, in reality, particularly if they're like US Treasury bills, the world is going to shit. So you've probably got bigger yes, problems yes. than losing a shit ton of money. On the flip side, you take 15 or 10% to 15% of your investments and put those into speculative assets. Uh, what you're doing there is you are heavily weighted towards very risk-free assets. <laughs> In the industry, they call them risk-free. Of course, they're not completely risk-free. Yep. And fifth, you know, s- some small portion of your assets go into things that are very high risk, so very high potential for complete ruin, but small percentages of chance to absolutely go crazy and to the moon. It's the notion of asymmetry, right? So bang on. It's the exact notion of asymmetry. The really good thing about this barbell strategy is that by taking an 85-15 or a 90-10 approach, your downside is capped, your upside is still maximized, but you're not going all in on your maximizer. Now, he talks about that's option one around a barbell strategy. We'll come to what option two is later on when we talk about the implications for the financial market. And just put a pencil on that, but we... We just jumped, we were talking about psychology. Now we jumped to investing. We, as I said, we're going to go all over the place, biology, philosophy, history, whatever. But as, as you talk about, um, as you talk about here, you mentioned the barbell in 85, 15 or 90, 10. One, historically, what, what we believed in years ago when I wrote this angel investing essay, which we'll link in the show notes. Um, it's, it's one of the pieces of content that kind of put our, put our content more so on the map uh, or our brand. Um, one of the things I speak about in there is how we believed at the time, because we're young, we were even younger then, that 80% of the investments go into S&P 500, because if that fails, and it's like we have bigger worries, America's failing, which we've, I've definitely changed my mind on recently. Uh, and then the other 20%, which is like angel investing tickets. Now, then my mind changed after I wrote that, Strong opinions loosely held. My, my mind chain is like, okay, not the S&P 500, but rather the MSCI World Index. And people like Ray Dalio get trolled, but his content on the future of China, and you start thinking about emerging markets, you start looking at um, some of the shit show that's going on in America. Again, we, this, we want to discuss Lindy ideas. We don't want to get into politics or modern or current affairs or whatever. But we, I then said, okay, MSCI World Index and angel investing. But then if MSCI World Index is your 85% side of the barbell and angel investing is your other 15% side of the barbell, I've been presented with ideas in this book, prior to this book as well, but even more so in this book, that have challenged my thoughts around even the MSCI World Index. I'm, I, I, for years, I've said to you and to others, I've said, yeah, you know, if that goes to shit, then we have much bigger worries. But it's like, 
exactly you'll never expect or know that the idea of that going to shit is a black swan in itself and so it's quite uh immature and i think after having read this idiotic for one to say 85 percent of the barbell going into msci world index which is like it's like the s p but the world basket of stocks i think that's also stupid so then one thing so what should you do which is an idea i'm exploring now should it be all in treasury bills as talib says because this book was written 20 years ago that i also have my thoughts on that um so for the investing nerds it's something i'll probably write about more at some point or maybe later in this episode or another episode we'll dive into more but it's just to use a real world example of my own experiences and our our story of how we were so bullish on the s p 500 and it has gone up a lot since then but that's the whole point because it's gone up it doesn't mean it will always continue to go up and the unexpected the unpredictable the black swan event that that could happen uh it's not to be disregarded and just to say yeah you should put your money in s p 500 or the msci world index that's that is blindness i think i i i'd agree um so there's i want to bring up by the way, I'm still on the prologue. I haven't. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, actually, it's, it's actually mad how much of it. There's two or three things. For those of you watching, I'm, I'm, if you're looking at the book I'm holding, I'm only a few pages in all the ideas we've discussed so far. <laughs> there are two or three of those blindness um, kind of points that I mentioned earlier that come up and I think are explained well by the examples you just gave. So I mentioned there was a confirmation error, which we spoke about as using the past to predict the unseen future. So this talks to your thing around like, okay, the S&P 500 has done really well for the last however many years. 100 years or whatever. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to continue to do well, even though we've just hit an all-time all -time high on it. Yep. Um, the second, third, and fourth things all bump jump into exactly what you've just said. Second thing is around is called the round trip fallacy, which is the need for corroboration or straw manning our own arguments. There's this concept of steel manning and straw manning. Steel manning is taking the other side and making as strong an argument as possible to understand where the loopholes in your argument mm -hmm. are. Basically sense checking everything from the other side. Straw manning is taking your argument and keep building on it. Right. It's a straw man. It's sure. not it's not strong. Um, so we have this need as humans to straw man everything um, by using arguments with evidence that f that fits our view, um, but not considering anything that is the alternative. Right. We think that because history has told us that this is the way that S&P 500 has worked, it will always work like that. And here's a million examples of why that's the case. Um, and this uh, this need to always corroborate things, so make everything that is similar appear the same, right? So <coughs> this is the point around, um, you know, if it's, it's quite interesting. There's like multiple examples used here, but you could say that all terrorists are Muslim. Yeah. Therefore, all Muslims are terrorists. Yeah. Right? It's absolute bullshit. But that is corroboration effect the round trip fallacy that makes it appear whole as a human that people fall into. The second thing was the narrative fallacy, which is you take that round trip fallacy, but then you add a story to it. Mm -hmm. This is where journalism is really, really shit sometimes because in order to make something believable, they have to put a really nice story, middle end, uh, I don't know, like a character that goes through an arc. All of these things are super important because the human mind tends to be drawn to stories and that's not how facts work. That's in chapter six, by the way, we'll come back to that. And then the final thing is the ludic fallacy, which is because there is very little connection between what real life is in all of its beautiful randomness mm -hmm. and what we learn through sterilized um, environments, such as the classroom, basically built on Plato's concept of models and what he terms as Platonicity or Platonicity, yes. which is this concept of when we learn things, we learn them in the best possible manner of that thing existing. We learn mm -hmm. models and maps of things. Um, so what we tend to do is fall into this trap of thinking life reacts in the same way. So this is the four by four matrix of how everything works. Life must fall within this. And therefore you come up with a nice story and a narrative to fit that. Um, you use the round trip fallacy to corroborate everything you're saying and you use the confirmation error, which is to say, because it's happened in the past, it will happen in the future. Yep. 
all of these things come together to make that story around why the S&P 500 is so powerful appear as though it's the best strategy for moving forward when it's not. So I'm just going to pause there, but those are kind of like the high stuff. He also talks about tunneling and distortion of silent evidence, which we can get into, which are also related. But I'll pause there. Yeah, so he talks about an extension of what you said on platonicity and the nerd, Yeah, which he says, I mean, he goes on and on here. I'm trying to not read it all, but it's so good. And he says, what many people commoditize and label as the unknown, air quotes, or improbable or uncertain is not the same thing to me. It is not a concrete and precise category of knowledge, a nerdified field, but it's opposite. It is the lack and limitations of knowledge. It is the exact contrary of knowledge. One should learn to avoid using terms made for knowledge to describe its opposite. Um, and later he goes on to, uh, you know, the plat platonic fold is the explosive boundary where the platonic mindset enters in contact with messy reality, where the gap between what you know and what you think you know becomes dangerously wide. It is here that the black swan is produced. This is exactly right. So the gap between what um, the models of our understanding of what a world looks like in the best of cases, um, you know, the, the the thing that keeps coming to my mind is the, the term or the phrase, all things being equal, which is what you literally learn if you do any economics or yep. I don't know, whatever. Um, all other things equal, what does X, Y, and Z mean? That's literally the worst thing, worst way to learn because you fall into this platonic fold, which is you use, you use these models with all things being equal <clears throat> and you use that model to apply it to messy real life and it doesn't work. There's two things that emerge from that, right? There is this point around distortion of silent evidence and tunneling that emerge from exactly what you just talked about, which is when the platonic fold essentially emerges. Yep. The distortion of silent evidence is you only see successes, you don't see failures. Yes. And this is exactly what he talks about in, F, in Fool by Randomness as well. I, I keep saying FBR. So if I do say FBR, I'm basically referring to the previous book. Um, so if you're like, I don't know, at sea as a sailor and, you know, you are, you're in a storm and you're miraculously saved and you come back to shore and you tell everyone the reason I was saved was because I prayed. But what about all the sailors that died but still prayed, right? So this is the distortion of silent evidence. You don't hear yep. about those that have died. And then there's tunneling, which is one of the core concepts that emerges in terms of cognitive, cognitive biases in this book, which is as humans, we shy away from what we don't know but we double down and focus only on what we do know. Yep. So this is exactly to the point of what you just read out. Um, we can come to the um, Umberto Eco's anti-library yeah, oh, in a second. We'll get there. But tunneling is essentially this thing is like, we tend to level our thoughts and our explanations for things in things that we understand. And this is wrong because actually there's so much more that you don't understand versus what you do understand. And so you're stuck between this thing of having to explain everything only with the limited knowledge that you do have. Um, but yeah, let, let's, let's maybe move on to the anti-library because I think it, it builds on all of these points yes. that you've mentioned. Before one, one last one before we do. Uh, so the bottom line, because we started this whole thing, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes. I don't know how long it was. We're still on the early stages, but I think we're half an hour in, mate. <laughs> we're like 30 minutes in and you started that, this kind of section with let's discuss what is a black swan. I think not only have we defined it, but we've given several examples. We've given an extension uh, of, of the ideas that relate to a black swan. <clears throat> and Talib also says in terms of like the bottom line before he really gets deeper into the book, he says, to summarize in this personal essay, I stick my neck out and make a claim against many of our habits of thoughts that our world is dominated by the extreme, the unknown, and the very improbable, improbable according to our current knowledge. Mm. And, all the while spend, and all the while we spend our time engaged in small talk, focusing on the known and the repeated. This implies the need to use extreme events as a starting point and not treat it as an exception to be pushed under the rug. I also make the bolder and more annoying claim that in spite of our progress and the growth in knowledge, or perhaps because 
of such progress and growth, the future will be increasingly less predictable, while both human nature and social science, air quotes, seem to conspire to hide the idea from us. And that's how he pretty much sums up as like the bottom line of the book before he really gets deep into each and every single chapter, which part one, this book is in three parts. Part one is Umberto's eco anti-library or how we seek validation. So do you want to discuss Umberto's eco anti-library to kick this off? Because he talks about, you know, just to wrap up on this before I hand it over to you, says that indeed, the more you know, the larger the rows of unread books let us call this collection of unread books an anti-library. And so what Taleb suggests is, you know, your library should include more unread books uh, than, than read books. And it should be full of, it should, I don't know, I guess he says in, in a way, maybe he's getting at the point that this should somewhat intimidate you. Um, not in a sort of negative stressor way, but in a positive stressor way of look at how much I don't know, which one of the core ideas of this book anyway is, is the unknown. Uh, and so you realize how much, yep, you know, I've read a lot, I've accumulated all this knowledge, but there is so much I still don't know. Mm -hmm. And one should always have an anti-library, which is all of the books in your library that you have not yet read. Uh, one should have you know, a good number of books on their bookshelves that not yet read that somewhat intimidate you or, or look at you. Um, so that's a summary of the anti-library, but I'll, I'll let you get deeper into Umberto Eco's anti-library or how we seek validation. It's interesting because <clears throat> this goes back to this point around uh, both the ludic fallacy, but also this point around tunneling, which is we tend to become more aligned to what we already do know versus what we don't know. And so what that creates is this uh, very interesting shield, if you will, against wanting to learn more information. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because like when you hear like people, I don't know, people that go on podcasts, right? Smart guys going on podcasts. They talk about, huh? <laughs> they talk about, <laughs> they talk about like, using knowledge as like creating a foundation of knowledge and then adding like structures on top of layering. that knowledge bang on it's exactly layering even musk talks about like elon musk talks, talks about this um once you have a fundamental understanding of some of the core concepts of physics for example you can then build on those concepts um this also connects to we'll link it here the episode i did on charlie munger and peter kaufman's multidisciplinary approach to thinking and connecting all the big ideas from the major disciplines uh, or sort of capturing 80% of the big ideas from the major disciplines and how they all help and link with one another. And as you said as well, in terms of layering, but, but please continue. It's interesting because like when you then add this point around layering and the point around tunneling, which is, you know, we don't want to see anything apart from what we already know, what becomes really important is the forcing of yourself in a sense yep. of uh, two things. One of learning a shit ton more to so always being humble enough to know that you need to learn more, but also in terms of making yourself realize that you ain't shit. So when you combine this, and drive and hunger to learn more with a humility of I ain't shit mm. and I need to keep learning. You create a environment where you're far less likely to fall into these fallacies and biases mm -hmm. like the ludic and um, uh, tunneling fallacies biases. So that to me is essentially what overall this anti-library thesis is about, but it's now kind of like grown into this thing of well, a, a couple of ways to think about it. This point around gathering as much information and books and insights as possible. So you're always like physically and mentally surrounded by what you don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then also like this weird obsession with look how much I know versus other people. Yeah. And then this kind of like masturbation of like, I know I don't know shit and yeah. therefore I'm like status signaling that 
I don't know shit and therefore I need to do more. <laughs> so like you get into this weird like concoction. Sounds uh, somewhat similar to midwit mean, which I know you have your thoughts on as we'll get onto later, but. It, it literally is. But then the interesting thing is, the final thing I'll say on this anti-library, Talib in this book talks about how he took some period of time out when he wanted to learn. Uh, I think this was post-college. He takes some time out or something. Or he makes a little bit of money and he takes some time out. And he spends like an entire period of time, like a summer learning shit mm -hmm. and just reading as much as he could and collecting books and reading loads of Lindy stuff, um, which made me think of something, which was a couple of years ago or a year ago or something, a, a podcaster named Lex Fridman <laughs> posted on Twitter saying, here's my list of long evergreen books that I intend to read and make podcasts yes. about. And guess who came and told him to fuck off and told him this is stupid? <laughs> Mr. Nassim Nicholas Taleb himself. So it gave me this thought of a lot of what Taleb describes in this book around building a physical and, you know, whatever, anti-library around yourself. He is actually living that. Why? Because at first glance, you'd think, yeah, but Taleb, you did this. Like mm. you tried to read all the books and da 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 and you even speak highly about it in this book. Yep. But you are intellectually honest enough mm. that after the fact, you're able to say, um, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a waste of time at all, actually. He learned a lot from it. But that process is like a signaling process, which is throwing you into the trap of tunneling and the ludic fallacy and all of these things, mm. um, which are cognitive biases that all humans have. And he's basically calling that out so he doesn't fall into that trap himself. Anyway, long story short, the anti-library in that concept, I found it very interesting, but I can see why people would think that he is going like against his own word mm. when he's written something in a book and then changes his mind about it. Yes. And to zoom out, uh, because we, we did go kind of zoom Deep. in on the anti-library, but to zoom out, uh, he says the writer, because we're, we're talking here about Umberto Eco's anti-library or how we seek validation, which you touched on, but... The writer Umberto Eco belongs to that small class of scholars who are encyclopedic, insightful, and non-dull. He is the owner of a large personal library containing 30,000 books <laughs> and gold, serious golds, and separates visitors into two categories. Those who react with, wow, senor, professor, dottor, Eco, what a library you have. How many of these books have you read? And the other, a very small minority who get the point that a private library is not an ego boosting appendage, but a research tool. Red books are far less valuable than unread ones. The library should contain as much of what you do not know as your financial means, mortgage rates and the currently tight real estate market <laughs> allow you to put there. This is brilliant. You will accumulate more knowledge and more books as you grow older and the growing number of unread books on the shelves will look at you menacingly. So we, uh, a friend of the show, uh, Vizi Andre, who will throw up on the screen here. Uh, firstly, you should give him a follow on Twitter. Uh, there are not, I, I actually a while back messaged him and we ex exchanged some messages, but the reason I had to message him and rarely do I message like a content creator or an online personality or someone to just be like, Wow, like, the, I mean, most people's wow. wow, seriously, like, wow, much wow, much wow, throw, much wow meme. But firstly, he, throw up here his his Vizy Andre's Twitter, which you should definitely follow. But the reason I, I had to message him personally, directly, and out of the blue, just like compliment his work and his tweets, is because one, I constantly find myself nodding and agreeing, and it's just a lot of the things are thought provoking or an extension of foundation of ideas I have that I may have not yet fully developed and he's giving an interesting perspective uh, on them but he touched on this anti-library actually I think the tweet was uh, today yesterday so we'll throw the tweet up as well uh, which he says you know he's literally quoted he says wow what a huge library you have how many of these books have you read and, you know, he says, even if you read all of the books from your library it doesn't mean much the beauty of reading is about rereading which I touched on earlier in the episode. The beauty of reading is about the notes, actions you take and all of the reflections that get triggered thanks to the material in front of you. Yes. So echoing that as well, and, and uh, I thought we'd just zoom out a little bit just to get the importance of 
I mean, this this underpins a lot of how we approach these episodes as, as well and why I gave the preface of we're going to have to reread the inserto or Paul Charlie's Island like, because of how, uh, you know, f- phenomenal the ideas in these books are. But that's that's Umberto Eco's anti-library. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look, we've touched on the, t- the definition. So that was the first part. We touched on some of these blindness elements like the fallacies and, um, you know, all the stuff around tunneling. Should we move on to Mediocristan versus Extremistan? That's a big one. Um, <clears throat> there is just one point because look, this book, I don't know if you're watching, I have endless sticky notes. <laughs> you're saying let's move on to that, which I'd love to, but then I'm excited by another sticky note I've just seen before we get there. <laughs> so pff, where do I even begin? I mean, this whole thing, I, most of this book, I just like highlighting, highlight, I'm like, so what's the point of highlighting? Like usually there is a point to highlighting, but in this... <laughs> which goes back to the point of it's such high signal. But in, in one part, he talks about, uh, it gives a lot of history around, it, of course, growing up in Lebanon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Lebanese paradise suddenly evaporated, uh, etc. And he talks about how the, he experienced, you know, he saw in Lebanon a lot of brain drain, and brain drain is hard to reverse, and some of the old refinements may be lost forever. And mm. I wrote here, just like Iran. Mm. I wrote the same thing. Um, <clears throat> The level of brain drain, I don't think people quite understand. What page is this on? This is... (laughs) Oh, you have a different book. You're going to laugh. I'm on page seven. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't even got into the book yet. Literally, I I, I want you to say what you say, and then I'm going to read out my sticky note, because I bet you... No, I I said it. I I read that. I said, just like you're on. Um, So yeah, I'll I'll let you extend on that idea. Well, read, read the quote. What was the quote? The quote is, brain drain is hard to reverse, and some of the old refinements may be lost forever. Just like Iran, I wrote. It's a sub-paragraph called Paradise Evaporated. Christ, this is so... Okay, so we might actually spend a good amount of time I think on this. this I'm may glad be, you brought this up. This may be one of those episodes like when Balaji went on Lex Friedman and it was eight hours long. <laughs> the book, the audio book of this is like eight hours itself. So I guess the reason people listen to us is for authenticity and, as Naval says, productizing oneself. Maybe you listen for us. If, if you do, thank you. Maybe you're, you know, you're one of the weirdos who finds us interesting if you do this this, this may be a very long episode we're just if you saying. do you probably have problems like us <laughs> yeah <laughs> but this is going to be a long episode let's just all right please continue okay, okay. So, so i think we're going to need like six pee breaks <laughs> coffee whatever okay continue what i wrote to that specific sentence i even put an arrow to it the brain drain is hard to reverse and some of the old refinement may be lost forever I wrote, my worry about Iran is exactly this. The imperial aligned culture may be lost forever as culturally the youth are so different while the smartest talent are all leaving. So you get this concoction of um, refinement culture within the country dissolving, which is what a lot of these Iranians with rose tinted glasses of the past of what the environment was that the second Reza Shah Pahlavi set up. they, they kind of like espouse this previous Iran to their offspring and, you know, all of this stuff. And therefore you get this kind of rose tinted view of the past. <clears throat> and it goes back to, if you, if you actually flick back a few pages to the p- prologue where he talks about a <laughs> new kind of ingratitude, he writes, and I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up is because it aligns exactly to all of this stuff. But there are even more mistreated heroes, the very sad category of those who we do not know were heroes, who saved our lives, who Uh, helped us avoid disasters. They left no traces and did not even know that they were making a contribution. This is one of my favorite parts of the book. Because he says, it is quite saddening to think of those people who have been mistreated by history. They were poète maudit, uh, like Edgar Allan Poe or Arthur Rimbaud, scorned by society and later worshipped and force-fed to school children. Uh, alas, this recognition came a little too late for the poet to get a serotonin kick out of it or to prop up his romantic life. Right, right. The, the point Instead is... Instead of reading off it, g- give, us, give us your understanding. Wait, wait, wait. There's one more point which is important. He says, we remember the martyrs who died for a cause that we knew about. Never those no less effective in their contribution, who's, but whose cause we were never aware of, precisely because they were successful. Yeah, yeah. I wrote this. This is why mullahs in Iran the leaders in Iran currently, have lauded and lent on the culture of lamentation and particularly the Iraq war martyrdom. In Iran, there's this massive culture of martyrdom being a good thing because it shows that we have success through a community of people that are willing to put down their lives. But what about all those other people that weren't outwardly martyred? And this comes back to the Iran point because 
we have this weird obsession, particularly Iranians, but Lebanese people will understand this as well, of having this blindness to what being an Iranian is and slowly losing what that imperial historical cultural element of Iran Iranian life was. And then on page nine, final thing, he says, this duration blindness in the middle aged exile is quite a widespread disease. Later, when I decided to avoid the exile's obsession with his roots, I studied exile literature precisely to avoid the traps of a consuming obsessive nostalgia. These exiles seem to be have become prisoners of their memory of idyllic origin. This is this exact same point about having a rose tinted view. Iranians fleeing post revolution and then they've passed this rose tinted view to their children. So I've written like Iranians should read this whole section because it's basically exactly what is wrong with Iranian culture today. They won't read it and even if they do, they'll just disregard it or forget about it. People but. are stuck in their ways. But this yeah. is the exact point around people being unaware of their biases people being unaware of what a black swan actually means, and then adding these post hoc reasonings and attributions to shit that was a black swan and expecting people to understand that. Just to wrap up that entire section, because I had that exact point highlighted as well, which you we were discussing, the, if you want to call them the unsung heroes or the, or the unknown heroes, uh, which is a, a new kind of ingratitude. So Talib here gives an example of assume that a legislator with courage, influence, intellect, yada, yada, manages to enact a law that goes into universal effect and employment on September 10th, 2001, a day before 9-11. And this imposes the continuously locked bulletproof doors in every co cockpit uh, at high cost to the struggling airline's shore, just in case, just in case terrorists decide to use planes to attack the World Trade Center in New York City. I know this is lunacy, but it is just a thought experiment. Uh, <laughs> and he puts something in brackets now, doesn't so he? Funny. Yeah. I am aware that they, there may be no such thing as a legislator with intellect, courage, <laughs> vision, and perseverance. That This is the point of the thought experiment. But he says, the legislation is not a popular measure among the airline personnel as it complicates their lives, but it would certainly have prevented 9-11. And so no one goes on to thank this legislator because because of the if you want to call it the unknown unknown mm. uh or the person who imposed locks on cockpit doors gets no he says that he gets no statues in public squares not not so much as a quick mention of his contribution in his obituary joe smith who helped avoid the disaster <laughs> of 9 11 died of complications of liver disease so it makes you think of i mean I, I've been having thoughts in recent months of like just always been th overthinking so much of the complication of the world around us and, and the unknowns, the randomness, just all the shit. And then you read this and it's just another slap in the face of like, fuck, this is so good. <laughs> and this is exactly why you should not be putting fucking retards on LinkedIn or Twitter on a pedestal with their threads or this is how I scaled my company. You should f follow my newsletter for tips on how you can also scale your company and it's uh, there's no more to be say no more as they say snm it's th th this Trust. right here is just absolutely brilliant i think what you've just spoken about is also by the way around that period he talks about the triplet of, of, of opacity oh, we have to touch on that now so, so the triplet of, of please, opacity please. is I'll, I'll be very quick with this no no this is a crucial section please but it does talk it does touch on some of the fallacies that we spoke about earlier there's three obviously a triplet of opacity as he talks about his the human mind suffers from three ailments as it comes to contact with history those three things are an illusion of understanding so this point around how we think we know everything even though the world is way more complicated the second thing is retrospective distortion so how we can assess matters only after the fact this is the attribution post so illusion post of understanding retrospective distortion retrospective distortion the second one which it, both of these things come up in fbr as well and the overvaluation of factual information and the handicap of authoritative and learned people, particularly when they create categories, when they platonify. This is this point around, um, you know, you get factual information about the past or uh, you're an authoritative person who knows a lot about a specific subject. Mm. And then using these models of how we've learned stuff in university or school, we you know, apply those to the messy world and it doesn't actually work. So those, those are the three big buckets of the triplet of opacity. Um, the reason why it's important is because all of the things that we just spoke about, particularly with regard to like Lebanese or Iranian, you know, people who've left the motherland after a black swan event. Yep. Um, all of these things are working in their brains as they try to make sense of what has happened and how they've lost everything. Yeah, they are unaware 
of such things taking place in their brains. One thing I just want to say is everything we've spoken about up to this point and the overarching view of this book, if you wanted to completely boil it down to a few words, is there are black swans, which are unknown unknowns. There are grey swans, which we'll get onto later, which are known unknowns. Mm -hmm. And then there are just known knowns, yes, which are things you just obviously know. When people apply known knowns to known unknowns, you, it gets messy. When people try to determine what an unknown unknown is, that shit gets very crazy <laughs> because they have no fucking clue. Yeah. Should we... Is there anything else you want to pick up on this before we move on to mediocrity? Uh, and extremist uh, you've touched on trivial <laughs> diversity. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, again, yeah, I got again I've got another one. <laughs> this, literally after what you just touched on, the next page, uh, I say here, Iranians talking about what if regarding the Shah, prisoners of their memory of idyllic origin. Uh, nobody knows what's going on. And he, he took exactly as what you've said. Yeah, uh, quote. If, it's, it's on uh, the section, no, the... The apprenticeship of an empirical skeptic. Nobody knows what's going on. And he says, one hears endless stories of Cuban refugees with suitcases still yeah. half packed who came to Miami in the 1960s for a matter of a few days after the installation of the Castro regime and of Iranian refugees in Paris and London who fled the Islamic Republic in 1978, thinking that their absence would be a brief vacation. This reminds me of uh, Eddie Sahakian. Uh, the owner of uh, obviously you have Edward here, Sahakian Edward Sahakian Eddie is his son apologies Edward Sahakian and you have here you know some, some fine cigars so uh, Edward Sahakian's story is brilliant I mean if, if you're interested more you should just search on YouTube Edward Sahakian Kirby Allison David of London story is phenomenal Edward Sahakian owned a few breweries he's an Iranian Armenian lived in Tehran good days owned a few breweries in Iran and he liked the finer things in life, you know, occasionally travel to Switzerland to buy cigars, do whatever, travel to London. He was in London with his family, exactly as Talib says in this book, in 1978. And the revolution happened. And he, ex Edward, I believe, is about 80 now, but he explains back in those days, he said, yeah, you know, we'll go back in a few weeks, things will calm down. And things didn't calm down. The revolution took place with full effects, things changed. And then he had to stay in London. Um, his breweries were burned down in Iran and uh, rest is history. He ended up meeting the Zeno Davidoff in Switzerland, opening Davidoff of London, which is arguably London's prime. It's the world's premier cigar shop. It's the world's premier, it literally is. It literally it's is. It's located in Mayfair, London. They serve everyone from politicians to I think even members or members or the extended members of the royal family and it just goes on and on and class class uh, family gentlemen but it, it's a that story I wanted to link to this because uh, I'm a big fan of Edward Sark and what he's done and also yeah he, he never went back to Iran I guess what we'll do is we'll come back later on and go through some of the uh, stickies and comments and thoughts that we have in relation to some of the more specific points. I mean, I have a sticky on almost every other page. Yeah, so I don't think we're going to have enough time to get through all of it. <laughs> what we'll do is let, let's, let's next discuss Mediocristan versus Extremistan, which is the next core concept. But before we do that, let's take a pee break and come back. So we're back from our pee break and we're now going to be discussing one of the core concepts of the book that actually I think most people think about when they think about this book, which is the two environments of mediocristan and extremistan. And if you're Persian, like us, it's mediocristan <laughs> and extremistan. The word ostan comes from the Persian word meaning province. Yes. Um, this is the little stuff that I love about Talib's books is that when he creates these, I don't know if he actually created those words, but I suppose he did. Um, it's just like what this like Middle Eastern flair to it, which yeah, is yeah, so yeah. sick. It's so also, it's actually quite funny. I know it's funny, but in the book, he um, he makes such a conscious effort to be called Levantine and not yeah, yeah. Middle Eastern or whatever, yeah, yeah, or Lebanese. Yeah. Okay, Mediocristan versus Extremistan. Mediocristan, he describes as being sim uh, an environment where single inputs don't change the average. Mm -hmm. So let's give an example. Uh, let's talk about weight or height. 
the reality is there's only a certain limit that human height is going to be like the tallest ever person if you put it in a group of another 100 average heighted people or you take a random selection of 100 people and put the tallest person ever in that group the average is not going to be significantly impacted it'll probably rise by like 1.5 to 2 percent all right so it's very easy to predict in mediocristan because you know that there's limits there's upper and lower bounds this is where the idea of platonicity which we talked about earlier applies as well because you're talking about best case scenarios ideas of perfection like these things are describing scenarios in mediocristan most of the time yes you've then got extremistan which as the name would suggest is extreme yep. because it's a scenario, it's an environment where the first 100 observations in that scenario tell you nothing about the next 1,000 or 100, whatever. So it's where one single input can have a significant impact on the mean yes. or the average. So you, you want to give an example? We're talking about scalable or... Just, just before you do, <laughs> it's so funny because I just caught a glimpse of his book and it says <laughs> leverage. Leverage, no code. <laughs> Take, so, take a shot. Seriously, take a shot. But okay, extremist on is scalable. And if you're an idea person, you do not have to work hard. Only think intensely. You do the same work whether you produce 100 units or 1,000. And so this is where the idea of leverage, <clears throat> Naval's idea of leverage comes from. And I think what Talib, I was discussing this with you before we started recording, because... W by the way, we're still on Mediocristan and Extremistan. We're going to stay on this for a while. It's a key part of the book. But as a side note, we, I was asking you before we started recording, I said, you know, we, we talk about leverage chasing, leverage optimizing, all the Naval talk. Firstly, Naval, I'm pretty sure he got... The more you read the inserto, the more you realize a lot of, ta a lot of Naval's ideas in his How to Get Rich thread and podcast basically come from Talib. Yeah, but he even says that himself. There's, yeah, yeah. there's that he interview says he, when he interviews Talib and he just praises him to death yes, at the yes, beginning. Yes, it's yes, because yes. he's literally stolen half of this exactly, shit. Exactly, exactly. And he said... Not stolen, but you know. He didn't say, yeah, and Naval himself said a thousand years from now you'll be reading these, which is literally what we say about these Lindy books. Anyway, and Naval... Naval, and, uh, take a shot. <laughs> our friend Eric Jorgensen, friend of the show, who's been on the show, he's going to come on the show. We discuss his other books as well. Um... He's he's huge on leverage. He has a leverage. We're, we're leverage nerds, put it that way. And I said to you before this recording, I said, but isn't it interesting? Talib in this book teaches how literally chapter three starts with the best worst advice. How when Talib was at Wharton, one of his classmates or someone, a Wharton st student told me to get a profession that is scalable. And Talib says he disagrees with this. And Tyler believes that you should actually get a, a career in mediocristan, not in extremistan. A career in mediocristan is, for example, I don't know, something like being a dentist yeah. uh, or uh, a, <laughs> you're going to, I mean, he doesn't recommend becoming a consultant. He hates consultants, but he gives an example that a massage professional or even a consultant, same as a dentist, they operate in uh, mediocristan because in these professions, no matter how highly paid, uh, you know, you are, your income is subject to gravity. Your revenue depends on your continuous efforts more than the quality of your decisions. Whereas an extremist done, uh, which is, you know, scalable leverage type of career paths, something such as, uh, literally Naval says, books, podcasts, blogs, programming, robotics, etc. It's more to do with your ideas. And we've always chased leverage. It's been a core part. I mean, literally the, the photo on the rationalvc.com website is of Archimedes and the, uh, right? So we've always chased leverage, but then Tala presents these ideas to challenge us, which is essentially getting to the point of, from my understanding, one should have a mediocristan career, a stable, kind of like links up kind of with the Bible strategy. You have a mediocristan career where you have a, a kind of, uh, how do I say, a, a repeatable, continuous uh, source of stable income, mm. yet you supplement that with activity side projects in extremist done, which kind of actually links up with also friends of the show, Daniel Vasalo and, and Louis of smallbeds.com community, which, which is the whole idea of what they do. 
where do you want to go from here? Because that, that was a side note to... No, no, it, it's relevant though, because um, it gives you examples of what work, this, this point around messy life and messy world versus platonicity and models of understanding. Um, but a couple of things. So the first thing is, the name of the chapter is chapter th in chapter uh, chapter three brilliant, is brilliant. the speculator and the prostitute, um, <laughs> and he writes one bit which I've tagged as being great dry humour. He says, um, "This is exactly what you said. Some professions, such as dentists, consultants, or massage professionals, cannot be scaled. There is a cap on the number of patients or clients." Da -da 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 -da. If you are a prostitute, you work by the hour and are generally paid by the hour. Furthermore, your your presence is, I assume, necessary for the service you provide. <laughs> um, so he's being like humorous, but raising the fact that actually this point around leverage can be construed in two different ways, depending on whether you're a mediocristan or extremistan. The other thing, the second thing I want to talk about is when you talk about extremistan, the best example is wealth. So he, I think he talks about Bill Gates in the book, which yes. is if you take a random sample of a thousand, ten thousand people, but you drop and their you know average income is a hundred thousand, or their average net worth is a hundred thousand each, um, the average will be a hundred thousand. You drop a Bill Gates in there with an average, with a net worth of a hundred billion. Yes. Immediately the average skyrockets, yeah, and therefore yeah. that group tells you nothing. That's like th there's no real. Um, induction you can make about that specific group on the basis of uh, the information provided. Yeah. So it's all about, while it is all about scalability, it's also about like the data <clears throat> that you have access to. Th there's a specific term, which is like sample size. Mm -hmm. So if the sample size is large enough, then the impact of an individual thing will not impact that sample size, mm. height, weight, whatever. But if the sample size is actually not that large, which if you think about it, human the human race isn't that large in terms of wealth, what you end up having is this like drop in the ocean having a massive dying effect on that ocean. Anyway, the point I'm trying to raise is it's very hard to explain extremistan if you've been raised, born in, raised, and learn everything you know about the world in mediocristan. Yes. I've actually, so a, bu a bunch of things you said there, I'm going to come back to. Uh, one of them is, I literally just said it because I, I wanted to ask you, I literally have here, beware, beware the scalable, right? Which Talib says, if I myself had to give advice, I would recommend someone pick a profession that is not scalable. Yes. Firstly, I, I wonder, this book was originally written 17 years ago, roughly. I wonder whether he's gone back on that, even partially at least. I don't think he has, but he, let's say he, he hasn't gone back on it. What do you make of this? Because what do you think? What you, <laughs> because we, we just, this, I, I just asked you as well. I said, you know, we, we've discussed this leverage thing and Talib here is saying, go after something in mediocristan, have your small bets on the side. And I said to you, you know, but yeah, we're leverage chasers like our friend of the show, Eric Jorgensen. Eric Jorgensen wrote the Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which has sold more than a million copies and been... I don't know, more than 4 million free downloads, whatever. It's absurd. Like he's hit home run, right? He's hit the jackpot in the publishing media world. He's now CEO of Scribe Publishing. But then I remembered, actually, you should throw up the actually meme. <laughs> actually. Actually. Eric Jorgensen himself was a product manager at a startup. He had a stable job for 10 years. He told us on the podcast, he came on, we interviewed him a couple of years ago. He said how difficult that period was where he would work his nine to five and weekends, evenings, he would, for several years, he was writing a blog and then collating every piece of information, speech, essay, whatever, from Naval to put together the Almanac of Naval Ravikant. And he said he had no free time. Quoting him, you know, he said the relationship suffered, everything suffered. But in the end, uh, it worked. Now, he probably did a whole bunch of other things that didn't work, which is the whole idea of small bets. He could have tried another 50 things and nothing worked. But the point is, he he is trying, as Talib says here, beware the scalable, because it could not. It's more likely to work than not. Uh, but yeah, Eric himself had something scalable and tr had small bets on the side until something worked. So what is your view of this? Because I, I do not think Talib has gone back on this. Um, and Naval preaches a lot of leverage and stuff, which people just 
even myself guilty of this like leverage for the win and yes leverage for the win but should one have a career in mediocre stun supplement it with small bets yes and the reason is because it fits into this point around scalability why does it fit into this point around scalability because in extremistan what you learn from data does not teach you anything further than what you have learned i.e you cannot make an induction on the basis of what you have learned in theory if you learn something in extremistan you're not able to build on it whereas in mediocristan you can also be comfortable with what you've learned from the data right well you can be comfortable with what you've measured and therefore you can be comfortable with what you've learned as a result it's easier to build a career in some in 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 that type of industry, in that type of environment, I should say, mm-hmm. because you will know that the effort you've put in and what you have learned will scale over time and you can build on it, right? Yeah. We talked about this in full by randomness a bit because in that episode um, and talked about like the value that comes from being a dentist versus something else. I think this links to that, which is to say you're able to feel like less of a fraud because you can actually point to what you've learned and how you've developed it over time. I think that's the core concept of it. There's an argument to be said if you're in a profession like podcasting itself, preparing something like this, each each episode is like, I don't know, 40 plus, 50 plus hours, everything to do with each episode, where you're like, "Mm, if I'm able to put in more time so let, let's have this discussion because i've said this to you and i said if if we were like let's say i'll give case study examples which one would say fooled by randomness but if we were to give case studies like david senra of the founders podcast or chris williamson of the modern wisdom podcast these guys have both sold businesses in the past and ample cash runway so they just have zero pressure of let's say financially and all they do is just record podcasts all day. And eventually through, as Talib talks about in this book, tinkering. So one would initially say fooled by randomness, but then I would somewhat challenge that with yes, but if a whole bunch of things come together and still it's not guaranteed to work, but a whole bunch of things come together like your innate desire, uh, your innate interest and in feeling like play and not work. And the endless tinkering as Talib talks about in this book, which is the whole world, this is why America is America. It's built on a culture of celebrating failures because after each failure, you tinker, you reiterate. And eventually with no financial pressures, endless runway, tinkering, and a whole bunch of other things coming together, it's not bound to work, but it has a good chance of eventually working, not for everyone. And then I said to you, but Iman, there's official statistics out that, you know, statistics, <laughs> the, 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 the statistic big maths. Quick maths. Big maths. There's statistics out that no, like only something like less than 1% of podcasts reach episode 20. Like they haven't given up. They've published 20 or more episodes uh, of the sheer number of podcasts that start from episode one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I said to you, well, you know, the because the sample, it's not actually fooled by random. And I, I was saying to you, if we just keep publishing and tinkering, eventually, whether it's episode 300 or episode 3000, eventually we'll, we'll basically have this as our full-time thing. Uh, we'll slowly grow it into its own proper media company and everything. To which you kind of argued along the line, and this was a while ago, maybe your views have changed after reading all of this, but you, you said something along the lines of, yes, but... It is also fooled by a randomness to say that because, you know, something like only 1% of podcasts have published more than 20 episodes, it means that we're also going to be successful. And I said, well, the sample size in itself is so small uh, that we, we, we can't actually say we're fooled by randomness. But then you said that in itself is full by random. <laughs> and we're just going back. There's actually a Twitter thing where we're going back and oh, forth. Yeah, and there replying. Is a I think there's like 10 to 20 uh, replies. We're just talking to each other on Twitter. And then shout out to- Authenticity. Shout out to Seb Lees of the Fat Tonys community, friend of the show. He was liking a few of the tweets. He, was, he probably had his popcorn. Yeah. He was loving it because he's a huge Taleb uh, Inserto fan. Uh, anyway. What, what am I getting with all of this? <laughs> what am I getting with all this? Which is because people listening to this are probably, a lot of people are in the same boat, right? Which is why mm. Daniel Vasalo's small bets community has blown up so much is because people have jobs. Mo- almost everyone hates their fucking nine to five jobs. 
and they want their side project something that feels like play and you know not work looks like work to others yeah looks like work to others but feels like play to them yeah take shot naval take shot naval <laughs> they want that to be their full time thing right and uh, yes okay many, many, okay many, sorry sorry continue continue yeah, yeah. so pe- pe- there's a good number of people who want that to be their full time thing but they know that this scalable thing in the extremist on uh which they their side project they want to become the full-time thing does not yet earn money and probably will not earn money because we're talking about literally you know we'll go back to please elaborate again your extremist on uh it's it has a low likelihood avoid yes. the scalable as talib says beware and he talib himself advises pick something that is not scalable like a dentist in mediocrist or something like that so that's why we're discussing this because so many people they want to get out of their nine to five but talib here is saying hey idiot <laughs> hey imbecile <laughs> keep your nine to five keep your stable source of income but then have a crack at small bets on the side my argument to that is in theory sure that's a very rational take but in practice in the real world that's also difficult because i'm giving you the argument of David Senra, Chris Williamson, these guys have endless runway. They just keep swinging. Some would say FBR. And I would say no, because of endless tinkering. And if you have the deep passion and it feels like play, then eventually, as Mark Andreessen says, you you bend the world to your will. Eventually, it's bound to work. So what do you have to say to all of this? What do you think? (laughs) What do you think? Um, Because we discuss this all the time. This is... Like for us, it's a key topic. And I know it is for probably a good number of listeners. They want to get out of their shitty nine to five. They want to do what feels like play and but looks like work to others. But it's an extremist on it's And Talib says, beware. You, so, so success can still come from extremist on as, you, 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 as we see and as you mentioned through the examples of some of these people that have blown up. Or, or done well. I should stop using the term blown up because he talks about that in a negative sense. <laughs> the problem is that th- j- this is genuinely fooled by randomness, right? So I guess that there are, you know, seven, 60 to 80% of people who start a podcast, for example, let's keep it on the podcast category, for mm-hmm. example, are actually very good podcasters or have the potential to be very good podcasters. Otherwise they probably wouldn't have started a podcast in the first place. The interest element of starting a podcast took them down that road. Why is this important? What you end up with is a sample of people that are actually more likely to be successful than not. So your, so your sample size in your sample in and of itself is already full by randomness. This is, this is what I was getting at, which is the sample itself, right? Is the problem, right? So, and, and you're right in that the market's early and it's a small enough size that you probably are not like choosing the right people. The problem is that this fundamentally explains the extremistan thing and focusing on a med- med- mediocristan career. Because even if you are someone who is capable of doing well in podcasting and you're not and you're not doing well in podcasting because let's be honest most of the views and the listens go to to a few people sure that would mean that actually your chance of success is even lower Mm. if you're in general population of people um so my my view is like you need at some level to you need at some level to basically have income mm-hmm. you know whatever i tweeted about this recently where i was like look the people that do that, that tend to do well either are like had a fellowship already had a shit ton of money or like you know somehow we're getting supported um because it's very rare that you find people i think i think it was or exited a business like the guys or, I mentioned. or exited a business and, you basically and, have runway you have your runway and burn worries covered but but the reason that's important is because the tweet that i made i'll throw it up on screen and put it in the show notes is the time that really impressive people spent on their modus operandi on Mm. their work and it was really big and their focus on non-focus stuff Mm. non-core stuff was really small which would identify this point around 
they had the ability to play in extremistan with by capping their potential downside which is this point of yes, ruin yes 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 so so basically i think we're arguing we're in violent agreement but we're arguing a little bit at cross purposes because in reality you have to swing for the fences in order to make it big like you can't not be involved in the industry you have yes. to be involved in the industry to do well and in addition you need to continue working in the industry to build the capabilities skill sets over time to be good at that thing exactly here on two three pages after where i was saying he says beware of the scalable and pick something in mediocristan he talks about scalability and globalization yeah. and uh you know the, the eu the europe versus usa debate whenever you hear a snotty and frustrated european middle brow <laughs> presenting his stereotypes about americans oh, yeah, he will often yeah. describe them as uncultured unintellectual and poor in math because unlike his peers americans are not into equation drills and the constructions uh constructions middle brows call high culture like knowledge of gotha's inspirational and central trip to italy uh, or familiarity with the delft school of painting yada yada and then talib goes on to say which I was saying literally a few minutes ago about this whole notion of tinkering, uh, iterating, take a shot in a vault, play iterated games. Uh, Taleb here says, it so happens that America is currently far, far more creative than these nations of m museum goers and equation solvers. It is also far more tolerant of bottom up tinkering yes. and undirected trial and error. And globalization has allowed the United States to specialize in the creative aspect of things, the production of concepts and ideas that is a scalable part of the products and increasingly by exporting jobs, yada, yada, and it goes on and on. So that to the point of what you said and so what I said about tinkering, it's, uh, it's a key, key part of having a scalable career yeah. uh, or having scalable endeavors, side projects, small bets, whatever you want to call it, is the endless tinkering that's that's a necessity. Rational VC itself, how many times have we tinkered on so many, every episode, every day we're tinkering different things. Not just on content, like we're tinkering on so many other stuff outside of the content as well. Um, but look, to, to the point is, your question was, if you want to escape your nine to five by doing, by focusing on the thing that is your side hustle, practical steps. You need enough capital, you need enough money to be able to take the plunge. That's the first thing. How do you support yourself while you focus on that side hustle? Second thing is, are you actually learning, developing and refining and mm. therefore tinkering uh, on that side hustle over time? And are you tracking how potentially you could be improving? Now, I made a note somewhere else in this book, which was, the life of a content creator is very well explained in this book. Why? Because yes, yeah. he talks about it in the context of book like writers. The correlation between effort and outcomes is particularly for content creators, not a great relationship because you can put in shit tons of effort for 10 years and see no outcome. And then suddenly one day, boom, right? It's Chris Williamson graph that he, uh, that he keeps putting up around yeah you know, you do nothing, you do, like nothing happens, nothing happens, suddenly something happens. And then something like he's had more listeners in the past month than he has in the entire five years combined or something like that. Exactly. And, and so what am I trying to get at? I'm trying to get at this point of raise enough money, make sure that you're learning and constantly tinkering all the time, but understand that the relationship between your effort, your input mm. and the output you get is not linear. And yes, this is yes, why yes, humans yes. struggle so much is like, you can't, we cannot conceptualize that. A key part of this book, nonlinearity, which he goes into so many times. Yeah, exactly that. And this is why I take my hat off to someone like Eric Jorgensen, because he was working a nine to five, or probably more than a nine to five, he's working in American tech as a product manager, but then he's constantly swinging and tinkering on evenings and weekends, which means a sacrifice has to be made somewhere. It goes back to my favorite quote of, in life, we must choose our regrets, which is the regret that he chose at the time or for several years. Uh, he's seen the results now, but the results are not guaranteed, as we're saying. Okay, look, I want to I want to move on to something that is. Well, actually, before I move on, <laughs> is there anything else you want to pick up on an extremist? Let's, on let's, let's a couple of stuff? areas I have very quick highlighted. In the utopian province of Mediocristan, particular events don't contribute much individually, only collectively. I can state the supreme law of Mediocristan as follows. 
When your sample is large, no single instance will significantly change the aggregate or the total. The largest observation will remain impressive, but eventually insignificant to the sum. Yep. And, you know, uh, in terms of Extremistan, inequalities are such that one single observation can disproportionately impact the aggregate or the total. Uh, and he goes on and on, you know, so he says, so while weight, height, and calorie consumption are from Mediocristan, wealth is not. Almost all social matters are from Extremistan. Another way to say it is that social quantities are informational, not physical. Mm. You cannot touch them. Money in a bank account is something important, but certainly not physical. As such, it can take any value without necessitating the expenditure of energy. It is just a number. So I thought I'd just wrap up that extremist on mediocre stand section with, that's a nice way to wrap it up. And yeah, take it away. Where, where, where do you want to go next with this? So what becomes interesting is he builds on this idea of mediocre stand versus extremist on throughout the rest of the book. Um, he introduces it quite early. I think it's chapter three or something. And we'll throw up table one for those watching. Yeah. For those listening, we'll try and see if there is table one online with a link we can throw in the show notes. But for those watching on YouTube, uh, we'll throw up on the screen. It's a table one. We'll leave it on for a good few seconds. Uh, a comparison of Mediocristan and Extremistan uh, in table one. Now, what's interesting about Extremistan is that actually a lot of our societal structures, our social structures, our financial structures actually all sit in that space. They sit in Extremistan. So that's why when we try to predict stuff or think about life, yeah. we're thinking in a Mediocristan style, but actually we're living in Extremistan. So the next bit, which leads on from this very nicely, which is one of the examples he talks about, and this isn't linear, by the way, we're not jumping to the next chapter or anything. This is actually later, very, uh, far later on in the book, I think chapter 15, where he talks about the intellectual fraud that is the Gaussian, <laughs> Gaussian or bell curve. We're all familiar with the normal distribution curve where 80% yeah. of um, data hovers around the, the average and then only like 20%, two ten percent hover around the edges. He basically says that bell curves only, ex only exist in mediocristan. Mm -hmm. Why is this interesting? Because the way to think about anything in society, like I said, is that in reality, the big events that happen, the black swans that occur, typically are always occurring in the variables that, that they are variables that occur at the extremes of the bell curve. So how do you explain if we're getting black swans over and over again, how can they only be in the, you know, 10% or the 20% most extreme random events? Because if you do the math, it's like, if you would have looked at the crash of 1987, you know, there's there's that scene from um, what's that? Uh, what's the what's the movie? The scene that we saw earlier when we were doing some research. Uh, the Big Short. Yeah. So the scene from The Big Short where the guy is like, never has an investment bank failed in in history. Yeah. I think this was in relation to 2008. But anyway, we'll see if we're going to throw it on as a for a few seconds here. Um, if, if not, but yeah, you carry on. I mean, like you take Black Monday, right? So in Black Monday. Uh, What's interesting is that you could have run an experiment to see how many times in history has <clears throat> something like Black Monday occurred. It had never really occurred. Yep. And therefore, it would take like two billion years before that thing would occur. Well, look, it happened, right? So because it happened, you can't apply the bell curve to this specific scenario. Why? Because this sits in extremistan. What he then introduces is this concept of Mandelbrotian randomness. Yep which reminded me of a phrase that you always use. You can, you can tell us who it's from, but only the paranoid survive. Andy Grove, rest in peace. Andy Grove, rest in peace. Um, Previous CEO, chairman of Intel, rose them to, you know, what we, what we know as the goated Intel, maybe not anymore these days, but in their prime. I don't want to get too much into what Mandelbrotian randomness is, but what he describes here is how can you take black swans learn from them and turn them into grace ones, mm -hmm. right? So things that are known unknowns. Now, a lot of the time ahead of time, you can remove the risk of being in a black swan environment by just taking small little steps. For example, 
putting insurance against your investments, putting stop losses on your investments, um, making it such that in a scenario where something can happen mm -hmm. that sits in, particularly in, in, scenario, in variables that sit in Extremistan, you're able to stop yourself from going bust or blowing up in that scenario. Um, so so the, the, just to, just to close out the thought, the reason why it aligns to only the paranoid survive is because if you have a paranoid view of any scenario that you're in, you're more likely to stop, you're more likely to preserve what you have in order to stop it being yes. at risk of blowing up in any type of scenario without knowing what the, the scenario could be. A few ideas link up here, kind of the, in terms of psychology of like loss aversion as well. And I think Talib talked about this in Fold by Randomness, but also here, how if you, let's say you have no money and you're given $10 million and a Lamborghini, and then you lose $9 million and the Lamborghini and you're left with a million dollars, you'll be psychologically more fucked up uh, with a million uh, now than if you were to start with absolutely nothing and still have nothing and not Correct. be given the 10 million in the first place. Um, and to your point, if you can just remind me, because uh, I have a few ideas floating based on what you said, uh, what was the last thing you said j just before the end? If you only the paranoid survive. So if you sure, uh, sure. So point of hedge funds. So you're, you're talking about Tyler talks a lot about, you know, not getting wiped out or managing your downsides or the risk of, you know, basically getting fucked and hedge funds. You mentioned this before hedge funds all have stop losses. So they manage the downside. And this is why there are so many fucking hedge funds. Majority of them, as Buffett says, struggle to beat the S&P 500 index. Yet all these funds remain in existence. One, because, of course, they're charlatans and they get they live off management fees, just like many venture capitalists. Shots fired. A lot of shots fired. <laughs> but hedge funds, the other reason they, they remain in existence beyond the management fees is that, well, they're getting some returns and they have stop loss. So they're protecting the risk of blowing up. Now, of course, there are hedge funds that are known, many are known for blowing up because uh, those are cowboys, maybe as Taleb says, very high on testosterone and don't manage the risk as they should. But a lot of hedge funds have stop losses in place, which is why they continue to remain in existence, even with subpar performance. And why the market is just flooded with, everyone's a hedge fund manager now. If they're not a VC, they're a hedge fund manager. It's just not non-stop shots fired. It's the so, truth. So, so hold on. So what's the point that you're trying to get to? That was it. It was just firing shots. Oh, uh, fine. Okay. <laughs> Mandelbrotian randomness. Yeah. How do you create a scenario where you are less likely to fall into the traps of extremistan? Only the paranoid survive. I'll leave it at that. We need to cover that book. But I think that is Andy Grove's books are Lindy books because they've been around for a few decades. The teachings are... Anyway, side note. Okay. Anything else you want to touch on while we're here? That's it. I think we can move on to... Now, nah, before chapters. we move on, I want to go... I want to basically tell you why the midwit meme is bullshit. All right, tell us. In this context... Before you continue, let's throw up the midwit meme here. Let's briefly explain what it is. I actually covered before it was like hip call. As I mentioned in the angel investing essay I wrote a few years ago on rationalvc.com, linked in the show notes, the essay, I threw up a midwit meme, which is about how there's many examples, but let's say on the, the left side of this normal distribution curve, low IQ, and then on the right side, the high IQ, they end up doing the same thing. And then the guy in the middle, who you could call the normie, he's going against the grain of both uh, and just overthinking, overanalyzing or whatever the case may be. So for example, the the midwit guy may say all all of this shit of like uh, optimize morning routine Andrew Huberman cold plunge five hours meditation ginger shot and then the low IQ and the high IQ are just like <laughs> just wake up gym get to work and then that's it so that's like one example but tell us please why you think despite it's I think the midwit is recently at its like peak of uh, popularity especially with people like George Mack discussing it on threads and on podcasts. So tell us why is this midwit meme that I've just explained or defined, why is it bullshit? 
specifically because he goes after the Gaussian curve, right? So what he says is... Tell us which chapter this is for anyone that ha has read it or wants to read just so they can keep up a little bit. So he talks about Carl Friedrich Gauss, who is basically the economist, I suppose, who, who wrote about uh, the bell curve. And this is why it's called the Gaussian curve. It's in chapter 15. It's called the bell curve, the great intellectual fraud. So that's in part three. Part three of the book, chapter 14 until I believe 18 is the somewhat more technical part of the book. Uh, so yeah, please enlighten us. I mean, he, he puts a little, it's quite funny because he puts a little asterisk literally on the title where he says the non-technical non or intuitive reader can skip this chapter as it goes into yeah. some details about the bell curve. Also, you can skip this, skip this if you belong to the category of fortunate people who don't, who do not know about the bell curve. Um, I don't want to like read that there's quite a lot of stuff in this chapter, but it immediately made me think of the midwit meme. Why is that? Because in the midwit meme, like you described, the person in the middle, right, is um, the overthinker, the person who's trying to apply, you know, the, the IYI, the intellectual yeah, yeah. idiot, as, um, as uh, Talib likes to say. But interestingly, it's weird because what the meme infers is that less than like 10% of people are idiots who believe one thing mm. and 10% of people are like Jedi masters who believe the exact same thing as the idiots. Um, but what extremistan tells us is that in a bell curve cannot exist mm. in extremistan. Mm -hmm. So when you're discussing matters of finance yes. or you know, whatever different things that you saw on the on the table that explains what examples of extremistan are, you can't technically apply the Gaussian curve. So if you can't apply the Gaussian curve, how are people applying the midwit meme to this to these specific examples? What's interesting is that the yes but actually meme <laughs> that you know people joke about and they think it's funny and whatever. I know it's funny, but when you put that lens on mm. top of, so it's the combination of a Gaussian flex, the person in the middle of the midwit meme, and this notion that the bell curve doesn't apply, or the Gaussian curve doesn't apply in extremistan, you put yeah. all those three things together, makes you question, why is it that people still believe in the midwit meme all the time? So Packy McCormick, for example, one of the writers of Not, uh, not, not Boring, boring yeah. Notboring.co, I think. Yeah. He recently tweeted saying, everything in life can apply to to this midwit meme. I told you it's at its peak of this midwit idea, so. Why is that interesting? It's because that would tell you that actually the 10% that are Jedi masters or the 10% that are idiots do not any longer exist because this has now breached what people yes, think yes, about yes. as being yeah. it's too common an idea now yeah. to fall within the two ends of the spectrum yes. anyway yeah. so you have this combination of everything we've spoken about so ideas in extremist are not being applicable to the bell curve you have this point around now it's being too normy anyway to believe yep. in the midwit meme so you end up with this point of actually the ideas being discussed as being aligned to the midwit meme are not actually correct i'll caveat all of this with Yes, but none of them give a shit. Actually. <laughs> Actually, but none of them give a shit. So the whole notion of the rational VC brand was initially well, founded on Talib and Munger's ideas, philosophies, but then we we're applying them to the VC startup investing market. And a lot of people would just be like, like disregard it. Like, so what, like to the moon, uh, raise 50 million to the moon, and no profit, to the, to, the, to the moon, everything to the moon. And so even now someone the other day I forgot his name. Some guy on Twitter, well-known founder, it seems like a fairly nice guy, interacted with him a couple of times. He posted a screenshot of the experience, the resume or the CV of the founder of Cognition Labs. Cognition Labs is a startup, raised a lot of money, developed a product recently with all the hype called Devin which is the first AI autonomous software engineer that can basically take freelance jobs from Upwork and do jobs. So why am I mentioning this? Took a screenshot of the founder of, of Devin, the founder of Cognition Labs' resume and said, wow, this guy worked five years at some like B2C startup and then he founded Cognition Labs. It just means that 
if something doesn't work for you, try something else. You swing long enough, eventually something like will work. And then I just replied with the book cover of Fooled by Randomness. I do that a lot on Twitter yeah, to like do. start up tech people. I either post Black Swan, Full by Randomness, Skin in the Game, yada, yada, just as like, stop talking shit, bro, in the, most, in the politest way. And also it means go fucking read the book as a reminder. Because me, myself, <laughs> every day, I'm duped by these things. Duped. And then a few seconds later, I'm like, <laughs> oh, Black Swan. Oh, Full by Randomness. Oh. And then I'm, I'm st- still manning both sides of the argument in my own brain, going back and forth like a maniac, <laughs> trying to come to terms with what is the fucking truth here, right? These people don't give a shit about any of this. None of this. So I reply to all these soy and valley bros with these book covers to say like, yeah, but the idea you have, maybe a little bit, you're full by randomness, maybe a little bit like here, Black Swan. And then they just disregard it. Like they don't give a shit. So my point is what you're saying about the bell curve and Gaussian. Yes, you're right. But then they're just like, and? And then someone like David Sachs would be like, yes, but with his Montclair hat, yes, but uh, you get to be right. I get to be rich, which is like, how about you, how about you do right and rich? How about you try and approach things that way? Which is basically the Taleb way. Taleb's right and he's rich. So, so a couple of things. Which actually, Taleb calls David Sachs as you said in the last episode. Techno watermelon. Techno watermelon. But he did come out and recently apologize. Not apologize, but tell Sachs that he was right about the Russia-Ukraine situation, where Sachs even was like stunned. I think he gave him... Taleb is so mature that he can give you credibility. Uh, hold on, hold on. He's not mature. He's very immature in the way that he goes after people. He, no, that's authenticity skin in the game. It's not mature though. 100%. He is very immature. <sighs> I just, but I think he's so mature that he can give Sachs credit on one thing, but then shit on him for many other things. Yeah, but you don't need to shit in such a... In such a... Like, like if your views horrible are, way. <sighs> anyway. Okay, so, so, so just, just, to cl- just to clarify this point. So... Um, Mr. Taleb himself, a lot of the time on Twitter will say things like, well, this is actually a fat tail distribution and therefore this doesn't apply. What he's talking about is more things in this specific scenario you talk about right. exist in ex- extremistan and therefore are fat tailed events. Mm-hmm. Why is that important? Because it means that um, because extreme events are more common than non-extreme or non-rare events, actually the the, the fucking curve doesn't apply. Yes. So yeah. why the hell are you applying this curve yes. in this scenario? People don't have the intellectual honesty or the capability to really understand that yes. this is exactly what's happening. I would posit that the majority of people that make midwit memes mm-hmm. are either midwits or idiots, which by their own logic applies. Yeah. And therefore it's bullshit. And then I go back to the argument of, and I agree with you, but I go back to the argument they're going to be like, they either disregard and shrug or, or they, they, they're so blind that they don't even see your argument. They're like, what? Anyway, uh, yeah, this founder, he did this startup and then this startup and he raised a billion. So, woo, let's go. <sighs> to the moon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Anything else you want to add on this or should we just move on to now the investing part of all of the fifth point that I raised originally, which was- I mean, there's so much investing. here. Do you want to go back to- because we jumped around to like chapter 15. Do you want to go, go to like chapter six, narrative fallacy and chapter seven, living in the antechamber of hope? No, because I think we've already covered those we, things. Because we've beginning. floated so many ideas, we've touched, I think, on the core. No, I think, look, so, so, so just to recap, what we've done is we've gone um, description of what a black swan is. We've then talked about all the fallacies that they talk about in the book. So that, is, that includes the narrative fallacy and all of the stuff you're mentioning in chapter six. Then now we've just described what mediocristan versus extremistan are. So when you combine the different environments that are mediocristan and extremistan with all the fallacies that exist and why humans struggle with um, why humans struggle with uh, black swans, you then get to a point of okay. So so what the how do you actually create positive black swans? Like I understand this is all of the issues that humans have, and I understand these are the different environments people can be in. But how do I take advantage of positive black swans myself? Or how do I reduce my biases? How do I remove my biases? Um, which he talks about in the context of, uh, you know, the barbell curve that we spoke about, the barbell strategy that we spoke about, uh, but also other financial mechanisms, um, which I think is what made this book so popular with hedge fund managers in the first place. Uh, but let, let's let's discuss that. Once we've discussed that, we can then go chapter by chapter and discuss discuss all of the complex specific specificities in by chapter sure so 
Okay, so where, where do you want to go next? Tell me. So I want to go to... There's two options, there's right? so many good sticky notes here. I'm, I need another six coffees. Let's go for like eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to discuss is go back to the barbell strategy. Please. As, oh, wonderful. Okay. As option one. And then option two being this point around going all in, um, which is his second option of how to essentially take advantage of positive black swans, which is where venture capital comes in. Let's go to the, you want to go to the investing umbrella. Yes, sir. The key part, okay. This is an important point. In many parts of this book, Taleb refers to venture capital. And mind you, this is initially published 17 years ago, 18 years ago. So venture cap, I mean, Y Combinator had maybe just been founded uh, a year or two in. Venture capital was not anywhere near what it is today, especially with number of players. But he seemed to show a lot of praise for VC in terms of being a positive black swan, which I touched on earlier, and one should gain exposure to it. Now, it's very interesting. I know it's funny. But and it's very interesting that all the people who have entered this VC market, especially post-COVID, have not necessarily done it because of Taleb's wonderful teachings in this book about those people don't even know what a positive black swan fucking is. They've simply entered the market because mimetic desire has driven... Uh, their actions and shout out Luke Burgess wanting previous guests on the show. You should read wanting linked in the show notes, which he talks about mimetic design, mimetic theory, and uh, you know, exploring Rene Girard's uh, ideas and teachings. VC now is, is not VC because people have followed most people in VC have not even read black Swan. A lot of people in VC, I think actually even dislike Taleb because just just as I do, he shits on them in the in the sense that they are no skin in the game charlatans that live off management fees with subpar returns, no operating experience, and all the usual shit that I've been talking about for years since we founded Rational VC as a so brand. Just pause there. Um, the fact that you've spoken about this so much is evidenced by the fact that you can now recite exactly what you just said, word for word, over and over again. Like you've memorized what to say about how fraudulent these people are. Trucks. Anyway, continue. So yeah, it's to say that, okay, let, let's get into this investing umbrella. VC yeah. is a large part of it. Yeah. It's our brand. We do that. We have rational.fund on the side. We, we do syndicates. We do special purpose vehicles, which is we do one-time raises in startups that we feel like investing in. Uh, and you can go to right this site. This is not a plug, but genuinely, if you want to see more of how we apply Taleb's philosophies and Munger's philosophies, to investing, which is we have skin in the game, no charlatanism, no management fees, yada, yada, a bunch of other things. Go to rational.fund and you can read more about how we operate that. But let's get into it because he talks about venture capital a lot in this book. But people in, and, but in recent years, he's tweeted a lot about his disgust of VCs specifically. So he praises the venture capital business model as a positive black swan. But in recent years, he's tweeted it rightfully, in my view, uh, shitting on modern day VCs and all the new entrants and people in the market. Okay, so that's a very good summary of, I think, where his head was at when he wrote this. Um, but in terms of like, how do you learn from black swan theory and everything he's spoken about to date? And how do you apply a insurance policy if you will against black swans well yep. we talked about only the po only the paranoid survive but there are two options the first option is in a financial markets perspective you either take the barbell strategy which is um hyper conservative but also what he des describes as being hyper aggressive 85 percent on safe stuff 15 percent on non safe stuff um the second option which is where hedge funds become in particular um relevant is he talks about an insured portfolio so you go all in on very specific bets which is what venture capital does right you put a shit ton of money behind something or if you are a hedge fund manager you back a position with a significant portion of your funds but what you do is you add insurance insurance can be two things either one you can take out an insurance policy with a specific insurer around the bet you're making the problem is they don't that, that is such a specific thing to insure against that a lot of insurers won't support you on right. or you do something more practical which is you add a stop loss to that to that um, strategy you say as soon as my losses go above 15 percent mm -hmm. cancel 
Like we take what we take that as a learning and a loss. We yeah. don't try to keep writing it out because as a lot of popular sayings in the markets go, the market can stay wrong longer than you can stay insolvent. So why am I talking about all of this? The reason we're bringing this up is because when you talk about VC, it actually applies to both buckets of option one and option two. In option one, it applies insofar as you're only making, VC becomes a smaller allocation of a total portfolio. But in option two, it's actually the large portion of the portfolio, but you're taking insurance policies against downside. There's no real way in which VCs are insured against losing LP money because the whole business model is around how do you throw as many darts as possible without the concern for downside. The only downside potential that exists in that framework is that you are spreading your bets as wide as possible. The problem with that is that is goes against option two. The, op the whole point of option two is not to, as Charlie Munger talks about, God rest his soul, not you know, spreading yourself too thin and going after what you believe to be right. Yes, and mind you, this, fuck, I have like four thoughts in my head uh, trying to don't know which direction to go. It explains the size of your head. It really does. <laughs> You're talking about venture capital by design is risky anyway, and it's money that kind of essentially they're willing to lose. Exactly that, because even the LPs who have funded those VCs, let's say a huge pension fund or whatever, that pension fund will put, they'll literally do a barbell strategy. Huge pension funds with billions or endless, endless amounts of funding essentially will allocate 85, 90, God knows, even family offices, we're going to even talk about smaller LPs. Even British family offices who are invested in our syndicates or the investments we have, they'll put 85, 90% of their portfolio in very safe, secure, low, much lower risk, very low risk investments. And then 10 or 15% of their funds is put to the side, de designed to be YOLO'd basically. <laughs> is designed to be YOLO'd. So those pension funds will fund these VCs. These VCs will be living off the management fees with no care in the world. They're like, ah, the pension fund and the family offices, they're willing to lose this money. We'll live off the management fees. We'll write a bunch of shit on Twitter and pretend we're cool and just go skiing in Napa Valley and pretend whatever. And we'll throw a few darts. Fuck it if nothing happens, which kind of explains why so many funds recently have started to shut down. Mm and they struggle to raise fund two or fund three or whatever. And if people go to, again, plug rationalvc.com, we'll link it below, the first ever article I wrote, tech markets are irrational, what to focus on. I basically shat on this entire model of, uh, and we knew, so we had soft commits to raise a fund a couple of years ago in the peak of the market. After thinking about it, we decided against becoming full-time VCs, exactly because we knew eventually this is gonna come crashing down and it has. And people, and we struggle to raise fund too. And, and one of our values is long-termism. There's a right way to do the things very long-term. And some very prominent GPs, general partners who are like solo GPs or very big Twitter thinkers and think boys or investors who I would, I would have been like, okay, these guys will definitely raise a fund two, fund three. Even they've struggled to raise a fund two and three and they've closed down uh, like very big names in the VC space. So it just goes to show exactly to your point and an extension of what you said that by design it is money that not only the vcs are willing to lose but it's because the lps who have funded them have allocated that funding for it to be lost allocated allocated with a w because of my southern iranian dialect we extend some words for the w <laughs> <laughs> I, I transfer it over to english freshies are gonna freshie you know i think that brings to a close some of the points that were raised. I think if we read this markets. book 60 times, we do another 60 episodes on this. There's political. way too political cranky. There's way too many good ideas in this book. It's a very, again, high signal book. And my my head's starting to hurt a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll take a break shortly, but let's go to the next section. Now you know how I feel. <laughs> so just to clarify, so we just spent a couple of hours going through the, stru the structure <laughs> All right, of what we took from the book. What does a black swan mean? What are our different human blindnesses to black swans and why? What does mediocristan versus extremistan mean? And what are those different environments and why we can't treat them equally? How that applies to the Gaussian curve in particular and bell curve mathematics and midwit memes and all of that good mm. stuff. What does that mean for investors? Now that we've closed that out, we want to use the next part of the podcast to go through chapter by chapter 
talking about two things. One, the specific concept that Taleb talks about per chapter, and then discuss on top of that, the second thing, what are our takeaways and our experiences and the random thoughts that came into our heads and your big head around that specific chapter. So I was just going to say, I'm I'm flicking through coming across, these sticky notes get better and better with in terms of like, personal stories, our stories, experiences, but I think that's a good direction. Let's do a quick, because we said, you know, we said we've done what we've done so far in the episode for two hours. <laughs> let's, let's give a few minutes of a quick recap and a quick summary of generally all the chapters. We try not to, we'll try not to take more than five or 10 minutes as kind of a midway point, just to zoom out really a lot, completely zoom out. And then once we've done that for five or 10 minutes, hopefully five or 10 minutes, then we'll come back to exactly as you said. Then we'll go through all of our personal stories, experiences, and so many brilliant sticky notes I have here. So let's do that. So let's start with chapter one. Chapter one is the apprenticeship of an empirical skeptic. Yep. Uh, in this chapter, we start with this whole idea of... <laughs> we start with this whole idea of Tyler talking about his experiences, about Lebanon. This is where we took a lot of the Iran stuff we spoke about. Um, and understanding exactly what an imperial skeptic, empirical skeptic is. He then introduces this whole point about a trip to, triplet of opacity, which is building on some of the core concepts from Fooled by Randomness. On, yeah. And then I think that's basically it. It talks about like what a distorted outlook is and basically starts to introduce the concept of the black swan. We talk about rereading and the importance of these ideas. So since we've zoomed out and we're going through each chapter very quickly, you've pretty much done chapter one already, but... The last step is, uh, you know, you, you talk about the triplet of opacity, which defines the three missteps a human mind makes when approaching history. Uh, let's quickly touch on those three quick bullets. So this includes, you want to you wanna get this Yeah, off? sure. So th those are the things we described earlier. So those everything from not realizing that things are more complex than we understand, um, having a distorted outlook when it comes to retrospection, uh, and then how we platonify or add simple heuristics slash models to very complex things, i.e. We, we, we often oversimplify the reasons behind something. Oversimplification, that's very dangerous. Um, okay, let, that's done. Let's go on to chapter two. This is an interesting chapter because he kind of writes a little story here, doesn't he? Yeah, why don't, why don't you talk So this is chapter two is Yevgenia's Black Swan. Uh, he talks about Yevgenia Krasnova in my Russian attempt, uh, who wanted to publish a book that she'd written, uh, met several publishers, editors, yada, yada. None would, none wanted to publish it. She went to some writing workshops. Um, she, she was, you know, they told her stick to the usual routine where writers just tried hard to create stories that were just an imitation of other successful stories. And then eventually, you know, some Russian publisher felt that, you know, he had nothing to lose. Let's publish Yevgenia's book. Uh, and uh, the unexpected happened. Yevgenia became uh, a literary sensation, sold millions of copies of her books. Uh, this unusual event changed the perception of publishers. And then suddenly they wanted to accept the fact that an idea when, you know, exposed in its raw form, uh, you know, let's go ahead with this. Yevgenia's book is nothing but a black swan. Uh, and readers, of course, who then go and search for Yevgenia and Google are going to be disappointed to, to see that it's uh, it's a fictional character that Talib, he's made, up. he's made up, but in such an awesome way to really drive home the point of a black swan and the fickleness. Because the whole, whole the first time I read this chapter, two, I was like, ha, 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 these idiots. Ha, ha. And then right at the end of chapter two, he's like, this is fictional. <laughs> and then the whole time I was saying, ha, ha, idiots, is because you see that happening in the real world so often. Uh, so, I mean, this is why people say we should read more fiction, because really it's, uh, it's a good way of understanding the world, you know? So uh, that, that's chapter two. I don't know if you want to say anything else on that chapter. Uh, I remember reading that chapter and thinking, this is made up. Yevgeny is a made up story. The reason I thought that was because it fits so perfectly in what he was trying to describe that I thought, nah, he's... and then, yeah, it was. But and, uh, and, and funnily enough, I was on a plane, so I couldn't even Google to sense check whether it was like, halfway through the chapter. 
the the part that made me laugh is towards the end where I was like, he said it's fiction. I was like, haha, of course. Yeah, of course. It, it, yeah. it reminded me of, of course, hindsight wise, right? But it reminded <laughs> it reminded me of in uh, Fool by Randomness. Fool by Randomness. He had another fictional story, so I was like, yeah, I'm starting to get yeah, used to Tyler. That's you, how he writes. You understand, yeah. so you understood instantly how he writes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, chapter three. Speculator and the prostitute. We've already touched on this one, which is the funny prostitute. We quote spent a made. good amount of time on this. This chapter, is I think. The, yeah. This is basically where he, he describes about- mediocristan, and extremistan, the two domains of randomness. Chapter four, one thousand and one days, or how not to be a sucker. Uh, touched on this as well. As I said, we've jumped around so much that we've touched on most things. In this chapter, Talib narrates the story of a turkey. Uh, that was fed for 1,000 days and then on the 1,001st day, uh, you know, the Black Swan event happened where uh, the people, the farmers fed the turkey on Thanksgiving, uh, fed them to on a, di- on a dinner plate. So this, this is the whole confirmation error stuff, right? So this is the stuff of the past doesn't predict the future. Um, you know, we like narrative Pharisees, all of that good stuff. Chapter five, confirmation, shmonfirmation. <laughs> By the way, this is such a... Iranian uncle Middle Eastern thing confirmation 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 yeah but he's doing it in like the Italian way right so it's right, like capiche right. and all of that stuff <laughs> um, this is again so confirmation confirmation is the confirmation fallacy the round trip fallacy you know this whole thing that we spoke about Muslims being terrorists i.e. You know, terrorists being Muslims and Muslims being terrorists and then this whole thing around looking for corroboration of all yes. of this. So this is where he starts to bring in all of the Kahneman and Tversky stuff. Then what's chapter six? The narrative fallacy. Humans being generally, us humans generally assign narratives of uh, casualties to events that are random. So uh, he talks about, we often believe in stories that rather than sticking to facts that are logical uh, and naturally, you know, this kind of behavior is ingrained in us where we condense information in order to make it a unified story. You know, I think you, you touched on this partially as well, but how Taleb says that this results in a loss where we ignore data that doesn't support the narrative we have. We do this by tricking ourselves into believing something that might not be true. Uh, chapter seven, living in the antechamber of hope. This is the basically the chapter where he talks about contradictions that lie in between chasing and activities that are dependent on back swans and other activities that are performed mainly to deliver proper results. Basically, he's he's creating scenarios and op, and examples of where mediocristan versus extremistan mm-hmm. can be leveraged. Um, and then this whole point around like linearity and non-linearity he starts to talk about here because we all tend to focus on linearity, like humans only think in a linear perspective. Chapter eight is Giacomo Casanova's Unfailing Luck. The problem of secret evidence. And, and so... Giacomo for all the Italian listeners. Giacomo. <laughs> By the way, you know you know that in recent months I've refused to learn German. Uh, and I've said that if there is a language I, I would spend time learning, it would be Italian. It, it, it sounds... You live just, in Germany. <laughs> I know. It's, it just sounds beautiful. I mean, temporarily. But it just sounds beautiful, right? So French, French and Italian. I mean, you, uh, Arius, our friend who's Arius speaks French... You're probably ele- elementary French. I mean, I did the A level in it, so yeah. I should remember it. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, French and Italian, nice languages. Uh, so, chapter eight, Tyler begins with silent evidence, a concept that is similar to the anti-library we touched on, where it emphasizes on the unknown over what's known. Basically, the silent evidence comprises of instances that are not acknowledged. Yeah, this is the whole sailors who prayed versus didn't pray that we talked about earlier. Yeah, in other words, they don't become black swans. Uh, so we, we discussed this, you know, people who, let's say they're, they're the unknown heroes, you can say people who, are, and you think about the sheer complexity in the world and why we shouldn't be putting people or specific people on pedestals, which is the modern day culture of the world. The, uh, really good example he talks about this in this chapter is gambling, where he talks about people who always say, oh, I was so much luckier when I first started out, which creates this notion of people thinking about, you know, this notion of um, beginner's luck in gambling. It's not the case. It's just (laughs) because you've gambled for so long. The reality is over time, you're going to lose. The house always wins. So like, this is just a fallacy. Okay, chapter nine, you want to... Yeah, ludic fallacy. So we we touched on this as well. Humans overemphasize what's seen and ignore anything that isn't quite so obvious. Um, the fact that uh, we, this is quite interesting, where he talks about worrying about stuff that's occurred, um, but usually 
ignoring something that could have happened but didn't. If you knew all of the shit that could happen to you, you'd worry probably a thousand times more. So it's probably not even worth the worry. And again, he touches on this whole point around not being able to understand what a black swan is, identifying black swans, recognizing them. And then how do you judge your own limits in that context? Um, this is the whole thing around like how do you start to think about the par only the paranoid survive and, 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 and holding yourself to account when it comes to black swans. Yes. Uh, moving on, chapter 10, the scandal of prediction. So here he talks about epistemic arrogance, which essentially means that we humans are arrogant about what we think we know. So to, to cite examples, refers to a study where participants overestimated their abilities when asked to solve questions. Uh, note that the accuracy of people competing in such studies is irrelevant, but the overconfidence they displayed when answering those questions is important. Yeah, uh, this is the whole taxi drivers did the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the problem lies in the fact that we think we know more than we actually do. So yeah, as you mentioned, the taxi drivers and how taxi drivers probably know as much or if not more than your typical pseudo intellectual or, or intellectual fraud as he likes to call them people in suits in wall street who sit around a boardroom table mm -hmm. making up shit about predictions of markets or current affairs or how things will go and and how a taxi driver probably knows probably knows more than those those guys and this is why we have such a trub such trouble uh predicting the future is because number one we don't like you know the whole anti-library stuff we do not hold ourselves to account for how limited knowledge we do have um and then also we compress possible outcomes all into single singular simplified oversimplified stuff uh that narrows your set of parameters chapter 11 how to look for bird poop uh and here he talks a lot about something we've discussed a lot on prior whether it's been tweets essays podcasts talks about serendipity where discoveries that were unintended turned out into huge breakthroughs. Uh, so, for example, it talks about how America was discovered when the real intention was to find a new route to India. Um, and so when you prepare yourself for something that's unintended, you open the doors for serendipity that allows you to identify and utilize black swans to your advantage. So take a shot, Naval. I mean, Talib talks about this in the book, and this is where Naval's, some of his famous tweets and ideas came from, came from where he... Naval says, you know, move to a big city because more randomness, uh, more serendipity, uh, go to a cocktail party, meet more interesting people, potential co-founder, potential spouse, potential whatever, whatever. Um, and just putting yourself in positions, which if we've done it in prior episodes, but we'll throw up Naval's tweet where he says, move to a big city, uh, tweet more, uh, go to cocktail parties, back then he was like, buy Bitcoin, uh, just all, all this shit. Well, not all this shit. I think the Bitcoin part is, is, is to be argued, but of course, 10% of one's barbell or 15%, sure, put your money in Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, because that's a portion of your barbell you're willing to lose. But then the upside is who knows? Who knows what the future holds? So uh, in that regard, absolutely. So Naval has extended Talib's ideas in terms of serendipity and putting yourself, positioning yourself in ways open to serendipity. The, the other thing he talks about here is he builds on this point around earlier in the previous chapter, he talks about... Um, us having problems predicting the future because of our fallacies. But then in the, this chapter, he says, actually, there's no, even, there's no point to even try to predict the future um, because the, the whole like potential multitude of outcomes that could occur are just not even calculable. So what's the point about us trying to predict? Because we can't predict black swans. Many black swans will happen and therefore like it's not worth the hassle of trying to predict stuff. Yes. Chapter 12. Uh, epistemocracy, a dream. Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, I want to troll you over your immigrant accent. <laughs> it's not as bad as yours. Shit. Uh, basically, he talks about like his idea of heaven to start with in this chapter, mm -hmm. which is this epistemocracy, um, which is where everyone understands their level of ar um, ignorance rather than their knowledge. So it's like the complete opposite of where we're at now. You're not trying to prove what you know. You're proving. You're trying yeah, to yeah. prove how much you do not know which is in a, in a sense a flex in and of itself. Um, and then he talks about this stuff around currently and in the past, any data you gather is probably not a good indicator of the future, particularly in extremistan. He talks about future blindness, this concept where we're unable to think yep. dynamically. And it's quite interesting because future blindness can be dependent on what we've 
previously been blind to. We interpret the past by relying on a backward process where we try to rebuild the past depending on the outcome we see. This is this whole, whole post hoc attribution of reasoning to something. Yep. He talks a lot about this in, in Fooled by Randomness in the previous book. Anything else from this chapter? No, it's a good summary. Uh, chapter, and we're nearly wrapping up with this uh, zooming out and of all the chapters. Uh, chapter 13... Apelles, is that a correct pronunciation? I think so. Apelles, or Apelles. Apelles, the painter, or what do you do if you cannot predict? Uh, so in this chapter, he basically Tyler offers practical advice in order to cope with randomness in life. He encourages people to prepare for the possible results of unexpected events. We'll get into some of these later. Instead of relying on a probability that the unexpected will occur. So let's say if you're trying to predict something and fail with something that's trivial it won't really matter much but if you predict something related to finance like the stock market you could end up in loads of trouble and so you one must rank beliefs according to the devastation they could cause and not rely on their plausibility i think that's everything in that i don't really remember yeah. that chapter to be honest it kind of like passed me but anyway uh, i think chapter i mean you could touch on it briefly but chapter 14 uh, he, he says from mediocrity on to extremist on and back chapter 14 to 18 is part of or yeah chapter 14 to 18 is part three of the book mm. and it's the part where he said he said it's the technical part you can skip it if you want uh, i mean it, it's still phenomenal reading as he said some people consider it an appendix to the book whereas some would consider it a key part or the or probably the most important part of the book nonetheless i think Chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, I don't know if you want to cover these. Yeah, so let yeah. me, I can rattle through these quickly. So chapter 14 from Mediocristan to Extremistan and back, he basically starts giving uh, examples of the inequalities that arrive from those two, from Mediocristan and Extremistan. He talks about sports in particular, when sports people play in tournaments, only one person wins it. The winner wins. The winner gets it all. Uh, even though one player might just be marginally better than every yeah. other single player, because it's in extremistan and the variables re relate to that. He then talks about uh, the Matthew effect, uh, the fact that if you're born with an advantage or you develop an advantage early on in life, you're likely to maintain that advantage over time because it follows you throughout your life. Uh, so you're able to like better gather resources and you know get more acclaim and get more accolades as a result of this fact that you got that early pro initial advantage the second part is on chapter 15 which is this bell curve the intellectual the bell curve that intellectual fraud which we've already touched You've on covered already yeah and then chapter 16 are the is the aesthetics of randomness uh, this is where the Mandelbrot rand um, concept of fractals is described which is where he talks about you know the difference between you know, a mountain is made up of fractals of many stones. He talks about like the fact that we study things in terms of geometry or shapes that are geometrical and whatever is neither here nor there because that never really happens in mother nature. Uh, there's this really interesting fact about, and I, I'll pass through this quickly, but when Everest was first um, recorded, it was recorded as a completely round number, something like, I don't know, I can't remember what the specific number was. I say it was like uh, 6,000 meters, like yeah. on the dot. Uh, but they had to change it and add two additional yards or meters or whatever to it so that people wouldn't be, wouldn't think that it was made up. So we have this like aversion to natural round numbers and we should do because actually it does, that's not how mother nature works. But this is the whole point around fractal randomness being imprecise. Yep, yep. Do you want me to quickly do, I'll do chapter 17. Uh, Logan There's Mann. only three chapters left, right? Uh, 17, 18. 19, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 17 and 18 are still part of part three. Yep. Chapter 19, actually, it's, I really like. Yeah, I like chapter 19. Uh, it's a special chapter, I think. So anyway, chapter 17 and 18, let's finish this part three, the technical part. Lokes Madmen, chapter 17. Lokes Madmen or Bell Curve in the Wrong Places. So talks about domain specificity and the way humans choose to forget black swans. For instance, the black curve was applied to economic matters after the stock market crash in 1987. The Bell Curve. Uh, sorry, the Bell Curve, yeah. Uh, but according to Taleb, this was inappropriate and uh, the people were unwilling to believe that the bell curve didn't help them. Uh, he also says that the Nobel Prize related to economics is useless since the prize winners have based their studies on the Gaussian model, which you touched on earlier as well. Yeah. Um, and lastly, chapter 18, the uncertainty of the phony. Here he continues to talk about domain specificity in this section. Specificity. Specificity. <laughs> I say it like a freshie. Uh, he also talks about 
phonies who copy model to men for one domain and use it for another. So basically this defeats the very purpose of the model and Tyler reiterates the tunneling concepts you touched on earlier, where people blindly accept concepts even when they are uncertain about it. Philosophers should often question how people can speculate about theological matters while accepting other, concept, other concepts when they are clueless in that area. They also need to question any accepted standards since they have an additional responsibility and are also professionally employed to do so. Anything you want to add on uh, the chapter 18 or anything like that? Nope. And chapter 19 is, why don't you give a quick little summary? I think chapter 19 is so special that we can maybe, once you've wrapped it up, I can pull out a couple of sticky notes and then we go into the back to the notes and stories again, if you want. I like it. So chapter 19 is called Half and Half or How to Get Even with the Black Swan. In this chapter, what he basically does is he summarizes all the principles that guide him in his life. Principles. Principles that guide him in his <laughs> life. Um, he talks about skepticism and then he gives some like wisdom points. He talks about how to take charge of your own life. So good. Control everything. You can control your time. Like he, he, he basically does what he does at the end of Fooled by Randomness, which is he gives not prescriptions, but he gives an overview of what you should think about in order to remove yourself from the biases and fallacies that he's mentioned across the book. I mean, it's it's only four pages, if that. And I've written... Yes, yeah, it's really short, isn't it? But it's very impactful. So it talks about... I mean, the chapter 19 is called Half and Half, or How to Get Even with the Black Swan. Um, and he says, you know, he opens this chapter with, it is now time for a few last words. So a few highlights. He says, I worry less about small failures, more about large potentially terminal ones. I worry far more about the promising, in air quotes, promising stock market, particularly the safe, air quotes, particularly the safe blue chip stocks than I do about speculative ventures. The former presents invisible risks. The latter offers no surprises since you know how volatile they are and can limit your downside by investing smaller amounts which ties so beautifully to even what I wrote in the micro angel investing essay linked below, which is that 10 to 15% of the barbell, which one YOLOs into angel investments. And one, if, if all goes to zero, one is okay with that because you've, you acknowledge that he literally says here, uh, it offers no surprises since you know how volatile they are. But then the other 85% of the barbell, if you are, uh, you know, putting it in specific or whatever you're putting in the stock market, and safe blue chip stocks that nothing will ever happen to, that's where you're really screwed because when, you know, that, that has, that presents invisible risks and unknown unknowns and opens you up to black swans potentially, um, which we discussed earlier. Um, and so an another great highlight in this chapter. In the end, this is a trivial decision-making rule. I am very aggressive when I can gain exposure to positive black swans mm. when a failure would be of small moment and very conservative when I am under threat from a negative black swan. That, that, that's a brilliant kind of tying up of all the positive and negatives I think we've discussed so far in the episode. I don't know if you have anything to add or say. Not really. I mean, I would highly recommend people read this book after having done a little bit of digging in terms of the... the Kahneman, Tversky stuff to, you know, starting with Full by Randomness. But if you do read this book cold, maybe reading the final chapter, even given that it's only a few pages, first, start with chapter 19 and see what he says. It will give you a gist of basically his writing style and what he's getting at. It, it also shows you how he thinks because he talks about himself so much in this chapter. And then it also gives you the answers to some of the questions you might start thinking about when you read the rest of the book. Yes. Um, Given, I mean, we're near the end of this chapter. It's such a short chapter, but it really drives things home that we've been discussing. So let me throw another couple of quotes, which I don't normally like to do. But half the time I am shallow. The other half, I want to avoid shallowness. Yeah. I am shallow when it comes to aesthetics. I avoid shallowness in the context of risks and returns. Uh, and another quote, he would say, 
you know, you can stand above the rat race and the pecking order, not outside of it, if you do so by choice. Mm -hmm. Quitting a high paying position, if it is your, your, decision. your decision, will seem a better payoff than the utility of money in, of the money involved. This may seem crazy, but I've tried it and it works. This is the first step towards the Stoics throwing a four letter word at fate. You have far more control over your life if you decide on your criterion by yourself. And then the next uh, party says, Mother Nature has given us some defense mechanisms, as in Aesop's fable. One of these is our ability to consider that the grapes we cannot or did not reach are sour. But an aggressively stoic prior disdain and rejection of the grapes is even more rewarding. Be aggressive. Be the one to resign if you have the guts. I'm just going to finish with one quote on the last, the literally the I last wanted page. To, I, want, I literally have the end, the whole paragraph highlight. I don't know. It might be a bit nah, lengthy no, to read the whole thing. Because yeah. it's, like, it's like 14, 15 lines. But the, the last bit of the last paragraph is Please. the best bit where he says. Oh, I know what you're going to get to. It's, this is the best bit. <laughs> uh, because you say this a lot. I have a quote like yeah. this. Yeah. Imagine a speck of dust next to a planet a billion times the size of the earth. The speck of dust represents the odds in favor of your being born. The huge planet would be the odds against it. So stop sweating the small stuff. Don't be like the ingrate who got a castle as a present and worried about the mildew in the bathroom. Stop looking the gift horse in the mouth. Remember that you are a black swan. And this goes to my quote where I, I mean, I'm kind of known for saying this now, but uh, we are nothing but a fart in the wind in the cosmos of time. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, j just before that paragraph, to put that in further context, it says, you know, what are the true odds uh, that, you know, just being alive? Uh, do you remember this meme of like Gary Vee back in the day? I was thinking day? the exact same thing. Gary Vee back in the day. You have only one million billion chance of being born. <laughs> the most non-Lindy content creator, uh, he would say, you know, first he's like, fuck your parents and go eat blueberries or something. But uh <laughs> He he, uh, he always used to say the odds of becoming a human being are like four trillion to one. I mean, I don't know where he gets these statistics, statistics from, but it, it, it's statistics. it's something it is something absurd. And the fact that, OK, once you are a human, then maybe you're in a day and age of, as most of history has been suffering or even today in many parts of the world suffering. But if you are listening to this podcast, uh, firstly, you're alive. Secondly, you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> Thirdly, because you listen to this podcast, most likely you're in the West or you just have the ability to seek such knowledge. It shows you have a curious mind. You understand English. Like, fuck, what are, add all of those odds. You've basically won the lottery of all lotteries. Like that, that in itself is the black swan of all black swans, I think. So should one, sh and this is, this, I mean, this is a lot of talking to myself as well of what one should be, a daily reminders of one should be more grateful. I mean, it's become a bit of a meme or cliche of, do your morning journaling and gratitude journaling, but okay, you don't necessarily have to do that, but taking a few minutes a day to maybe, whether it's meditate by looking at a nice view on what you're grateful for, it could be writing it down or whatever, but, and also just going for a lot of long walks, which Talib talks about in this book and, uh, or the notion of flaneuring, which, which he talks about. But, but you know, trying to, trying to drive a nice message here, which is really, we are a fart in the wind, the cosmos of time. It's a reminder to myself who does usually sweat the big stuff and the small stuff sweats everything it's like stop sweating the small stuff um like even historically when we've been doing podcasts i've enjoyed them but i was i was always historically sweating uh, tiny things like the volume sound level of this sound the sound of that and today i've i've genuinely i mean maybe i'm getting old but uh genuinely enjoying the presence of doing genuinely enjoying the presence of doing this more um so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we, we, I, I, are we wrapping up? It sounds like it, but I, I don't want to wrap up. I mean, I have endless. We'll, we'll go through some stories shortly of all the sticky notes. Yeah, we have. yeah we'll go. We'll go through stories. I don't think we're done yet. We're going to do a Balaji eight hours, but um, Let, let's let's let's. So this is a nice point to just take a break. Let's please. take a stop and take another pee break. I'm going to do some shadow boxing. You can have your 18th coffee of the day. Do your shadow boxing. Watch your Andrew Tate videos to give you <laughs> to, to give you energy, <laughs> and then we'll be right back. Shucks. <laughs> This is turning into like a Balaji on Lex Friedman episode. All right, so we've pretty much covered everything, the central ideas. We've gone through chapter by chapter. We then zoomed out, gave a summary of each chapter high level. 
uh, we went through the ending of the book, chapter 19, which is kind of like how one could uh, not act, how, how one could proceed being once you're aware of these ideas, how do you move forward? In the context uh, of Talib himself. Yes, yes. And then we said, right, everything's done. Now we're going to have some fun with it. Not that we've not been having fun, but we've got a lot of sticky notes. We're not going to go through all of them. We'd, we'll be here for a few days in that case, but... Every sticky note, it either represents some story or some experience we've had. Um, so yeah, let, let's let's take it away. The strategy for the discoverers and entrepreneurs is to rely less on top-down planning and focus on maximum tinkering and recognizing opportunities when they present themselves. So I disagree with the followers of Marx and those of Adam Smith. The reason free markets work is because they allow people to be lucky thanks to aggressive trial and error and not by giving rewards or incentives for skill. The reason I wanted to bring this one up is because we've kind of touched on this and we've spoken about it, but really interestingly, it's where we understand discovery to come from. And there's another quote that you can touch on, which you posted, I think online, where you talked about where innovations actually do come from. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the, the point I wanted to raise was this one is like, everything that we've done in Rational VC and everything that we've like tried to push forward with has been all about tinkering. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've not like we've been trying to increase our luck space by doing more serendipitous stuff. This goes back to all the stuff you're talking about, Naval. But I thought that was a good place to start because it kind of links from what we've been talking about already. Agreed. Uh, the quote you're referring to. Okay, this is the quote on the Rational VC site from Taleb. Both Huey and Bale were erudites and spent their lives reading. Huey, who lived in, into his 90s, had a servant follow him with a book to read aloud to him during meals and breaks and thus avoid lost time. He was deemed the most read person in his day. Now, this is the quote on our website, which Taleb says, let me insist that erudition is important to me. It signals genuine intellectual curiosity. It accompanies an open mind and the desire to probe the ideas of others. Above all, an erudite can be dissatisfied with his own knowledge and such dissatisfaction is a wonderful shield against platonos platonicity. <laughs> the simplifications of the five-minute manager or the philistinism of the over-specialized scholar. Indeed, scholarship without erudition can lead to disasters. Absolutely brilliant, wonderful. It's really well written as well. Yeah, it's so good. Um, I think on Goodreads, it's like one of the quotes that has so many upvotes or like thumbs up. Oh, and, that's a good point. Yeah, it is. It is. And, uh, and on Kindle as well, it has one sure, of the most yeah, yeah, yeah. highlights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, it's a quote we have on our website because uh, it kind of explains a lot of what we do with this podcast, with the content we put out, uh, with such aims uh, as, as mentioned in that quote. So that was an awesome one. Uh, and if you want to take us away with uh, another one, another one. <laughs> this is sometimes called fuck you money. Oh, this is brilliant. This, this is, is sometimes nice. called fuck you money, which in spite of its coarseness means that it allows you to act like a Victorian gentleman free from slavery. It is a psychological buffer. The capital is not so large as to make you spoiled rich, but large enough to give you the freedom to choose a new occupation without excessive consideration of the financial rewards. It shields you from prostituting your mind and frees you from out, outside authority, any outside authority. This is exactly what we were talking about earlier around people that make it having, you know, a little bit of freedom with their runway. Yeah. This is exactly that. Fuck you money is not about money necessarily. It's more so about the freedom your brain has from prostituting itself. A couple of things I'll add. Uh, we'll throw up my tweet which is actually like a thankfully twitter now lets you write a lot um and long posts i have yeah, a mini he, he can't be you know <coughs> short can't be contained yeah can't be contained. <laughs> uh, concise I, I was a caged animal and they you know that it can't be contained in a cage basically I, I like to write long essays anyway i've got this mini essay on twitter which will throw up on the screen where i talk about actually uh this notion of why do you as a grown man want to spend your entire life in the corporate world and be a corporate slave and i go into like i have a couple of mini essays on this we'll throw them up but like the meaning of life uh which sounds a bit trite but you know people talk about wanting to travel the world in backpacks and hostels and find themselves for two years and i just say 
do these four or five things and it's the meaning of life, which is, you know, one of them's procreation. The other one is becoming the best version of yourself. Again, trite, but in every capacity, physical, intellectual, spiritual, yada, yada. I go on and on with a few points. And I, I, I also mention doing what, feel, gaining independence, which is a FU money. And it doesn't necessarily mean let's not put a figure on it, but it doesn't mean 10, 20, 30, 40 million or whatever, which some people kind of, it's like the dream jackpot. Um, but it's enough, which gives you independence is literally the ability to say F you. And so for everyone that may differ, but in another mini essay, which as I said, we'll, we'll throw up, I talk about the way, it's actually the, 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 the tweet where I mentioned Chris Williamson and uh, David Sendra and such creators is that if one wants to do these kind of activities, you should lower your burn uh, in order to increase runway among among other things. Mm. And why all of this is important? Why is it important to know to not fall prey to materialism or keeping up with the Joneses uh, or status seeking gains in the corporate world or all of this yada yada nonsense is because you, you are then chasing the carrot on a stick. You are trapped uh you're essentially a prisoner uh of bs games rather than really focusing on what matters which is the deep games which is gaining enough independence or being able to do what you really want to do and aside from what you really want to do a life uh th that is dedicated to not only erudition uh but also procreation passing on your great qualities to those people and the meaning of life being other human beings surrounding yourself with great family friends etc focusing on experiences and yada yada uh the importance of this and a lot of this come does come back to not all of it but a lot of it comes back to fu money which uh, stems from a combination of low burn and increasing runway uh and the importance of what you touched on and i'll just wrap all of that up with a friend of the show jack rains who writes at youngmoney.co jack it, rains make it rain jack rains make it rain uh Awesome, awesome blogger, awesome writer. He's previously been a guest on the show. And he actually had an article a few years, a couple of years ago on the topic of FU money, which was published on Zero Hedge, the finance blog. Uh, he was tweeting about it and Taleb really liked it. And Taleb tweeted or, or retweeted this essay. Mm -hmm. And I think that Zero Hedge article is an awesome summary. Jack Cranes wrote beautifully in that, the, the whole notion of FU money. And we'll link that in the show notes as well for you to read. Hit me with another quote. I've got one here. I mean, we've mentioned them before, but let, let's let's mention them uh, one more time. Relating to uh, Daniel Vasalo and Lou with the small bets community, Talib here, he talks about, uh, you take the cemetery into account, independent inventions, right? So the researcher Thomas Astabro has shown that returns on independent inventions ones you take, uh, if you take the cemetery into the account, are far lower than those on venture capital. Some blindness to the odds or an obsession with their positive black swan is necessary for entrepreneurs to function. The venture capitalist is the one who gets the shekels. So when you look at the em empirical record, you not only see that venture capitalists do better than entrepreneurs, but publishers do better than writers, dealers do better than artists, and science does better than scientists, uh, yada yada, and goes on. And the reason this reminded me of Daniel Vasallo and Louis, because they, <laughs> you know, quite, especially Vasallo, he's quite skin in the game, outspoken. He kind of... Uh, fires shots at the VC model and he says, be a VC of your own ideas, which is build a portfolio of small bets of your own. Don't be a dream in someone else's portfolio because here the VCs are the ones who are actually getting the shekels as Talib says. So I thought that was an interesting one and one as a reminder to us and everyone else who's, uh, you know, uh, building things or doing stuff. Ah, 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 pause, please. How on earth have we not even touched on Fat Tony? Please. <laughs> I mean, you look like him and dressed like him. Shucks. <laughs> Just missing the watch. All right, where is... What? Would you not say that our dear friend, we've mentioned on a prior episode, Ali Carpet is actually Fat Tony? No, no. So explain what Fat Tony is, please. Okay, so Fat Tony, which <clears throat> such a prominent name, figure, whatever you want to call it, that, uh, you know, friend of the show, Seb... Lee's actually has uh, Fat Tony's community, which is, I think, a few hundred or a couple of thousand members. Yeah, it's in the thousands. Uh, it's in the thousands. Podcast, awesome blog, community on Discord. 
uh, which you should check out, also linked in the show notes. And what is the big deal with Fat Tony? Why do we care? So chapter nine, the ludic fallacy, or the uncertainty of the nerd, Talib here presents Fat Tony. And he says, and, and if, if you recall, the Nero he mentions here is Nero from Fought by Randomness, right? So yes. is it, it's fictional characters, but I'd argue someone like Nero in Fought by Randomness is actually Talib himself. He, anyway, let, let's get it, because Fat Tony f- characters do exist. It's, it's, it may be somewhat fictional here, but it's based on real figures in the world. So he says, Fat Tony is one of Nero's friends who irritates Yevgenia Krasnova beyond measure. We should perhaps more thoughtfully style him horiz- horizontally challenged <laughs> Tony, since he is not as objectively overweight as his nickname indicates. It is just that his body shape makes whatever he wears seem ill-fitted. He wears only tailored suits, many of them cut for him in Rome, but they look as if he bought them from a web catalog. Well, firstly, I'm offended because Savoro only, but anyway. He has thick hands, hairy fingers, (laughs) wears a gold wrist chain, and reeks of licorice candies that he devours in industrial quantities as a substitute for an old smoking habit. Licorice for those English speakers among you. He doesn't usually mind people calling him Fat Tony, but he much prefers to be called Just Tony. (laughs) Nero calls him more politely Brooklyn Tony because of his accent and his Brooklyn way of thinking. Though Tony is one of the prosperous Brooklyn people who moved to New Jersey 20 years ago. He gives this description of Fat Tony. There's more that comes around. There's a lot more. We haven't got into it yet. We haven't, yeah. He he fully... (laughs) fleshes out this character and then Fat Tony is like a recurring theme within Telebian work and within the Inserto series. You said that, do you think our friend Ali Carpet is Fat Tony? Now, if you've listened to this podcast, watched this channel before, we'll have mentioned one of our good friends, Ali Carpet. Now, Ali Carpet has never really worked for anyone. He worked for himself. He worked on the family business, working in an industry and an environment where you really do need to, it's a no BS environment. You really do need to know your shit. And that is the antiques market. The reason you have to know your shit is because someone could flog you a piece of shit and you have to have the intellectual capability to one, figure out it's bullshit, but two, also call them out on their bullshit because it's a small world and you don't want people to fleece you and that be made public. Now, the physical qualities described as to who Fat Tony are. Now, Ali Carpet isn't that short, but a lot of the physical qualities are the same. In so far as the one that really killed me was a thick hands, hairy fingers, wears a gold wrist chain. <laughs> And also, uh, he devours, you know, licorice as a substitute for an old smoking habit. Carps, as we like to call him endearingly, still has a little bit of a smoking habit. So we're not smelling the licorice yet. But physically speaking, yes, they're very similar. Why would they be similar on the the non-physical traits as well? Well, so I went to uni or university with Carps, short for carpet. Firstly... There's a reason we call him Ali Carpet. Uh, two, two reasons. One, because, well, the obvious, his chest being an extremely hairy Iranian resembles a carpet where one cannot actually see the tone of his skin underneath the uh, chest hair. And number two, because he actually is a prominent seller of Persian rugs and carpets. So he's in that trade in the industry of Persian rugs and, you know, Middle Eastern antiques, uh, deals with auctions such as Sotheby's, Christie's, whatever you want to call it, all the way down to your kind of bizarre style negotiating in the back room of a... Anyway, uh, for example, the story of he was recently on holiday with his uh, with his wife and he... He, he negotiates for a living, like he does it for the thrill. And so he went on some water activity in some island and he was sticking his head out of water. While he was in water, he was negotiating with the excursion guy or something. So this is a guy who even in the moments of trying to enjoy his holiday, for him enjoyment is, I need to stick my head out of the water while I'm in the ocean and negotiate with the guy. Complete skin in the game, uh, never worked for anyone, never has, left uni still in business for himself and i guess the question is why would one go to uni well it's a you know, classic persian thing of you know you must get your degree for when when it's time to get married people will say what degree does your son have we want to show a bit of it's the old school model of credentialism but anyway so completely disregarded the degree never used it and um even though he completed and he's always been in business and he's the most 
I, I don't know. You want to if you want to say wheeler dealer, but he, as I said, the thrill of negotiating and exactly as I said, hairy fingers and gold wrist chains and uh, all of that aside. Uh, I would say the street smarts and the stoic values and virtues and courage and empathy and kindness and all he has all of those great values yet he is still a, a phenomenal deal maker and no bs uh if you drop him in a bazaar in iran he'll he'll just do his thing he's like in his meditative state tony is remarkably gifted at getting unlisted phone numbers first class seats on airlines for no additional money or your car in a garage that is officially full either through connections or his forceful charm. I think that sums up Mr. Carps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot more we could go through, but I think a good way to wrap up this episode, we're usually against prescriptions, top 10 lists, top five lists, whatever. I mean, Tyler himself has mentioned various parts of this book that he is too. And there is a section called the 10 principles for a black swan robust society. Uh, and actually this passage, you know, footnote was published as an editorial in 2009 in the financial times uh he says some editor who no doubt had not read the black swan changed my black swan robust into black swan proof there is no such thing as a black swan proof but robust is good enough anyway and he wrote these 10 principles mostly for economic life to cope with the fourth quadrant in the aftermath of the crisis uh and there are 10 points so if you want to go through these and then lastly, Amor Fati, how to become indestructible. And we'll wrap there. Cool, let's do it. So the 10 points. What is fragile should break early while it's still small. Uh, you know, nothing should ever become too big to fail. Number two is no socialization of losses and privatization of gains, which really, to me, is screams skin in, skin in the game. Uh, another book we're going to get to, uh, not next episode, but the one after. Number three, people who are driving a school bus blindfolded and crashed should never be given a new bus. Uh, he's talking about the economics establishment, universities, regulators, central bankers, yada, yada, uh, you know, and how the economics establishment lost its legitimacy with the failure of the system in 08. Uh, it is irresponsible and foolish to put our trust in their ability to get us out of this mess. Uh, find the smart people whose hands are clean. And we shouldn't take advice from quote unquote risk experts. So uh, I recently, last couple of years, been thinking a lot about, it sounds quite Balaji-esque, but the idea of sovereignty, not putting your future or your future family's lives in the hands of such uh, decision makers. Um, so I think one should always, uh, on top of seeking, you know, a lot of knowledge or whatever you want to call it, uh, is seek... <sighs> I guess, as he says, find the smart people whose hands are clean uh, and a path to uh, have some form of robustness, if you want to call it, uh, for your life and your family's future life. Uh, you want to go on from number four, maybe? Yeah, don't let someone make an incentive bonus, manage a, nu <laughs> a nuclear plant or your financial risks. <laughs> odds, odds are that he would cut every corner on safety to show profits from these savings while claiming to be conservative. Bonuses don't accommodate the hidden risks of blow-ups. Screams uh, McKinsey to me. Uh, it screams uh, financial manager yeah. <laughs> to me. Uh, number five, compensate complexity with simplicity. Uh, basically try to make everything as simple as possible, but don't oversimplify. Uh, so he talks about complexity from globalization and highly networked economic life needs to be countered by simplicity in financial products. Yeah, number six is do not give children dynamite sticks, <laughs> even if they come with a warning label. Complex financial products need to be banned because nobody understands them and few are rational enough to know it. And, you know, bankers and selling hedging products and all this nonsense. Number seven, only Ponzi schemes should depend on confidence. Governments should never need to restore confidence. Cascading rumors are a product of complex systems. Governments cannot stop the rumors. Simply, we need to be in a position to shrug off rumors, be robust to them. This is my favorite one. Number eight, do not give an addict more drugs if he has <laughs> withdrawal pains. Using leverage to cure the problems of too much leverage is not homeopathy, it's denial. The debt crisis is not temporary problem, it is a structural one. We need rehab. This is, even to this day, to this day, uh, something that has been spoken about by leading figures, both in finance and politics, that is a massive issue. That 
just the cost of um, financing the debt is so high that it basically breaks the economy. Number nine, citizens should not depend on financial assets as a repository of value and should not rely on fallible expert advice for their retirement. Uh, economic life should be definancialized. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, make an omelet with the broken eggs. Um, we need to rebuild the new hull with new material. We'll have to remake the system before it does so itself. Let us move voluntarily into a robust economy by helping what needs to be broken break on its own, converting debt into equity, marginalizing the economics and business school establishments, shutting down the Nobel and economics. This is brilliant. No, they're right there, as you said, shutting down the Nobel and economics. Banning leverage buyouts. Banning leverage buyouts, which I used to do, unfortunately, when I was Putting a... bankers where they belong. Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, but basically, he's just basically calling out all the shit and saying, like, start afresh. I think that's a lot harder said than done. Though. Yeah, yeah. And those are the 10 principles, as he puts, for a black swan robust society. And I think the last segment, the last postscript essay of this book is brilliant and must be covered before we wrap up. And that is Amor Fati, How to Become Indestructible. And he says, and now read it, it's time to part again. And he gives a little story of as he's writing this, he's in his village, Amion, uh, in Lebanon, the village of his ancestors and where he was born and raised as well, um, gives a little story and, you know, kind of goes on to talk about the Stoic philosophers and uh, after everything we've learned in this book, after everything we've read, we've become aware of, how does one handle these uh, these things that, that we've been, uh, you know, reading about? Uh, a few quotes Seneca is the one who, with some help from Cicero, taught Montaigne that to philosophize is to learn how to die. Seneca is the one who taught Nietzsche the amor fati, love fate, which prompted Nietzsche to just shrug and ignore adversity, mistreatment by his critics and his disease, to the point of being bored by them. <laughs> Seneca's credibility as a moral philosopher to me came from the fact that unlike other philosophers, he did not denigrate the value of wealth, ownership mm. and property because he was poor. Seneca was said to be one of the wealthiest men of his day. He just made himself ready to lose everything every day, every day. That's amazing because he put himself in a position of not caring, but still living that life that most people want to live. I would argue <clears throat> almost everyone would struggle with that today. Uh, sounds quite think boy, but Tim Ferriss has an exercise where one day a month or two days a month, something along the lines of he'll try and live on just $5 a day where he's sleeping on the floor and he's eating cans of tuna just as a reminder to, is this the worst it gets? Uh, again, I would say maybe problems of luxury or first world problems, but how else are you going to try and put yourself in a position to appreciate the, I think something we're fond of is uh doing difficult types of exercise whether it's strength training or powerlifting or uh getting in a muay thai ring jiu-jitsu ring whatever you want to call it jiu-jitsu cage uh, on the mats um and i mean cold plunge has become a meme so i wouldn't necessarily <laughs> say that but doing difficult things like for example running a marathon or uh, building resilience through doing difficult things. Yes, okay. through uh, forms of exercise. Through, I mean, I think the most difficult of them all is really the game of entrepreneurship, uh, which forces a form of personal growth that is difficult to explain in any other way. I mean, it's all, all forms of personal growth coming together uh, in terms of like positive stressor. Um, so yeah, I would say that's another way. Just just before Please. we wrap up, so so the interesting thing is you can tell that this book has been written, was written at the same time as him mm -hmm. writing uh, Fooled by Randomness because the ending of both books are very similar in that he presents these uh, ways of thinking about how to counteract being fooled by randomness or being a victim of a black swan through stoicism. You know, he talks about having holding Seneca in his pocket everywhere he goes because he sees the value of Stoicism. Now, it'll be interesting in our later episodes to understand whether he still abides by this Stoic. This know, is what I'm curious reasoning. Now, because recently, uh, the last couple of years, it's become kind of cool now to hate on Stoicism. I mean, the <laughs> the obvious one is. Uh, 
Dr. Kapil Gupta, MD, at Siddha Performance. He's blocked me on Twitter. That's a claim to fame. If you're blocked by Lex Friedman and Kapil Gupta, that's a unique combo. Long story. But anyway, I, I, I still respect the work that he's produced. And I said that as well. Uh, you know, using some form of critical thinking, I'd like to hope. Uh, he shut on stoicism, which said it's a form of cope. I don't think Naval did, but a, f a few figures, a few people who are thinkers, writers, whatever you want to call them, have put out ideas of how stoicism is BS and it's cope. And other people also argue that uh, it's unhealthy for you to kind of not disregard your emotions, but you know how stoics respond to such events. It should be that uh, you're bottling things up or it's cope and you should just let the emotion out. Like, for example, if it's grieving, then it's healthy to grieve for a few days and cry your, eye, cry your eyes out or whatever the event may be, uh, the stoicism may be a form of cope. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, the Stoics themselves had flaws. Uh, was it Seneca himself? Or one of the Stoics had multiple partners or would sleep with married women or something? I don't know. But anyway, point is, again, it goes back to the unknowns. He's a goes goat, goat Stoic. <laughs> <laughs> It goes back to how much we don't know. Yes. And I guess that's probably the best way to end this, which is even there with the Stoic point, we try to steal man both sides and we're like, I just don't fucking know. <laughs> I just don't know. This is the thing. If you want to be someone who is breaking free from the traps of being fooled by randomness or limit your exposure to negative black swans by increasing your anti-library and learning more, do go onto rationalvc.com, put your email in, subscribe, will send you a shortened version of this podcast, an email format that will break down all the core concepts for you and make it relevant to today's day and age. We'll do this with all the books that we do podcasts on. We, as always, encourage you to like, comment, subscribe, get involved because it gives us an indication that people are enjoying this content and therefore a reason to continue doing it, even though we will continue to do it regardless. And finally, the most important thing is we do enjoy doing this and we will continue to keep doing this. Feels like play and Feels looks like work to like others. like play to us, but appears like work to others. If you've enjoyed this, one thing that the only favor we ask you, we haven't asked you to pay. We haven't asked for anything. And genuinely, I mean, every episode takes, as I said, 40, 50 plus hours with all the prep, the recording, the post editing, the marketing, the upload, it, it just goes on and on. And what you see here is literally like the one or two percent of the work, uh, just the recording aspect. So the only thing we ask in, in return is uh, other than subscribing, of course, on, on YouTube and on rationalvc.com, typing in your email to get the uh, it's like a pocket Lindy book, you could say, as you said, like uh, getting all the emails. You have those summaries in your pocket forever. In addition to all of that, just going on Spotify and hitting the five stars, leaving us a five star review and hitting the follow button because that helps us significantly. That and the YouTube like and subscribe help more than anything, plus subscribing on our site. So that's all we ask in return. Next episode will be anti-fragile, continuing the inter Inserto series. That's it. That's it. I don't know shit. <laughs> Rationalvc.com. Chicks. Chicks.